Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Yuri Wallach, my partner in crime as always, Vasily Giannarakos. How are you, my friend? Uh, doing well, Yuri. Weather's getting really nice here in Canada, uh, up to like 25 Celsius, so summer's in full swing. You got to translate that for us Americans. Uh, like 90 Fahrenheit or something like that. No, that's 85. too high. Yeah. Maybe 80 really? Fahrenheit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this sounds about right. Something like that. I'm not good with the translations <laughs> there, but... Uh, Me neither, dude. At least, at least it's getting warm. And uh, in terms of Flyers news, like it's slowing down, but we got a, a lot to discuss. So it'll be a fun episode, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. I I agree. We we do have a fun episode. It's a little lighter on news, um, but we're gonna continue our grading of the players this week. Um, and then we're gonna, you know, we'll talk about some other stuff that's topical, some free agent stuff, some some playoff chatter and uh also london is playing in the memorial cup tonight as we speak so um we got some stuff to talk about and uh if mitch Cobb comes up you know wasn't planned you know um but he does seem to come up in pretty much every conversation <laughs> relating to the flyers <laughs> but uh, um but yeah we'll try to keep it focused on other stuff for this episode uh, all right, so before we get started, just want to remind everybody, please like and subscribe. Subscriptions are almost at 1,000. Uh, as I record this, we are 37 away. Uh, we are super pumped. Thank you all so much for subscribing. You guys are awesome. If you're listening to this and you have not subscribed yet, um, please do. Uh, also, give us a like. Hit the notification bell for notifications. Uh, follow us on iTunes, Spotify. Give us a rating there as well. That's all tremendously helpful to us. And again, the best way to support us is, you know, give us rating, um, give us reviews and um, hopefully really good reviews and uh, also subscribe to us on YouTube. Our goal is to hit a thousand. That is uh, what I've always been told is the first thousand is the hardest. So we're almost at that thrush point now after, you know, more than four and a half years. So um, looking forward to that. And also shout out to our sponsors, Jim Stakes at 4th and South. Uh, they are open as the beginning of May. Uh, make sure to go get yourself a cheesesteak at 4th and South uh, from Jim Steaks. And also, shout out to Summit Public Adjusters, 215-752-0560. Uh, go to them for all of your adjustment needs when it comes to insurance claims and whatnot. Um, again, that's Summit Public Adjusters, 215-752-0560. Okay, Vasily, let's get into it. Um, we have a very short news segment uh this week and then we'll get right into the grading um so the bit of news and this is really from anthony demarco though you know it's kind of assumed um with both players um but you know i think we do want to give him a shout out here at least he referenced this so um i don't know if it's 100 percent true or whatever but um i think it's pretty fair to say um that both adam yinning and Igor zamula will probably be staying with the Flyers. There was more of a question, I think, of Adam Yinning, um, if he would opt to stay with the Flyers. Um, but I think Zamula was more of like, it's pretty obvious he's going to get signed. How much he's going to get signed for is definitely in question. Yinning, on the other hand, um, probably will, I assume, will get a very short-term contract, maybe one year. Um, he does have an option to go back home and make you know, close to as much money. But the fact that he got to play some games, again, we're going to grade his performance uh, this year. He got to play nine games this year with the Flyers. So there is um, some opportunity for him to kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel here to get a, a NHL spot. Uh, and there's also the other option that maybe somebody else around the league would still be interested in him. And he might not want to even go home back uh, to Sweden quite yet. Um, and I, you know, I think we both think there's an upside there. We'll get into that in the reviews. Zamula, on the other hand, uh, I always assumed he was going to be staying. I heard some, you know, discussions about giving him a one point seven two million dollar or two year deal, one point seven million per year. Seems a little bit high to me, to be honest with you. Um, I think he's going to get less than that. Uh, I could definitely be wrong. Um, I do think a two year contract is possible, um, but not a one point seven million. Maybe on a one year deal. Um, if it's a two year deal, I think it's going to be closer to one million dollars a year. I don't think he's done enough to be to prove that he is an NHL regular, um, but he has done enough to, you know, get an extension. Um, and I think the Flyers will look be looking to give him bare minimum because he has not kind of solidified his role. Again, we'll get into that. Um, what do you think about uh, that piece of news, Vasily? 
Uh, just to jump off of Zamula first, like I would agree. Um, I wouldn't expect him to get 1.7 million a year, especially if it's a two-year deal. Yeah. Um, just because the extra term, um, usually you would lower the you know um average annual value amount. Yeah. Um, but if it's one year, like maybe I could see it, or like something like 1.5 million. To be honest, I would kind of expect for both of them maybe to be one-year deals here. Um, and the reason being is it might almost be a last shot type of situation for both of them, right? Yeah. Like. Zamula got a, a big taste of NHL uh, hockey last season. At certain points, he looked really good. At certain points, he looked underwhelming. Uh, I think his biggest skill set was probably his ability to move the puck up the ice and just being creative in terms of his offensive zone entries. He would sometimes make some dangles and open players up when he would enter the zone. I think that was probably the biggest um, part of his game that probably helped the Flyers, just his transition ability. Um, and then with Yinning, it's kind of the opposite, right? Like He wasn't so much jumping off the page at anybody offensive but just his ability to shut down plays defensively. He's a bigger guy. Um, just kind of that stay-at-home, shutdown type um, defenseman. So I would expect if they're going to bring him back that maybe he's going to act as like a seventh type of defenseman. Um, but who knows, right? He could end up getting uh, sent to the AHL because you're looking at it, if they bring both these guys back, like they're still going to have quite a few defensemen, even uh, Emil Andre potentially knocking on the door here as well. So there's going to be a battle, obviously, for those final spots, similar to last season. But it's not... Um, unexpected to me that both would return just because look at the flyers last year and last season on defense right like think about all the injuries they had and you know down the stretch run having to plug in certain guys to kind of get by mm -hmm. if you don't bring these guys back um you're kind of shortening your depth and you're allowing for that possibility to happen again at least this time if you bring these two back they've already had some experience where you're not throwing rookies into that situation like you have yep. to do this year so yeah. True. And I think we also have to consider um, the fact that, you know, there's Hunter McDonald out there and everybody keeps talking about him. He's 22 years old, so he's not necessarily like a, you know, a 20 year old yeah. rookie, at least at the NHL level. But I don't think the Flyers are going to be rushing to move him into an NHL spot. I mean, that it could happen as him being a primary call up depending on his play. But I think he's always been looked at as a project type of guy, a guy who's exceeded expectations from where he was drafted. Um, and I think they probably see him as a potentially better version of Yinning. Yinning was a second round pick. Um, but I wouldn't jump to that. Like I, I see a lot of people penciling him in as a top four defenseman and all that. I don't think that's even what he projects to be. Um, if he ends up being that, that's like an absolute steal of a pick. Yeah. Um, but I think they kind of see him as like a Nick Saylor replacement down the line. So I think really it is between the four guys you mentioned, right? Adder, Zamula, Yinning, uh, and, uh, Andrea. And, uh, I think, you know, for the most part, I think they're going to try to temper these, um, these contracts. And I agree with you. I, th I think we might see a one year deal for both of them. Um, I, it, I think it depends on Tortorella's view of Zamula. Um, and how he thinks Zamula is progressing. Yeah. The role Zamula played as far as being a power play guy for the Flyers, I don't think that that is his permanent position. Like, he's not a power play specialist. He's got to be a two-way defender, but he has a lot of valuable assets, right, in the sense that he is big. Um, he needs to fill out more. He's not necessarily, like, rugged in any sense, but he is big. The kid can skate. He's not fast, but he's a, he's a good skater. Um, and he's got a two-way skill set. So I think with him, I would actually prefer they signed him to a multi-year deal just at a low cap hit. Because I do think he would even have some value in a trade. Not a lot of value. He was, again, undrafted. But if you sign, let's say you sign him for two years, and then um, let's say you want to move on from him in the second year, I think you can move him potentially for like a fourth-round pick or something like that. Um, just a guy who can plug in as a number six defenseman for a team with some offensive upside. Now, I might be a little higher on him, but again, um, I tend to not give up on defensemen who are 24 years old. Just, you know, turning 24 will be 24, 25 next year. So he's going to be entering that age where his NHL potential will be really realized uh, over the next couple of years. So they might opt to go for a two-year deal um, to get that cap hit down, to stay underneath it. But we'll see, because um, the cap's going to be going up considerably, and uh, they're going to have a lot of moves to make um, beyond this year. Like, this year, I think, is actually going to be pretty tempered 
in comparison to what we're going to be seeing the following year. So yeah, especially with the cap space opening up. And I, I think for Zamula, like you're spot on, right? Like just look at his skill set and look at what NHL uh, GMs look at for defensemen. He not to say he has it all, because I would say that his physicality is leaving something to be desired for his size, mm -hmm. but he can always fill out a little bit. Like he's six, three and only 200 pounds. I'd imagine the goals for him to get to around 220 at that size. Um, yeah. and fill out a little bit more, not as, uh, easy to knock off puck stuff like that but you have to factor in for Zamula right like 21 points in 66 games essentially as a that's rookie good that's a pretty good rookie season for a guy that strictly got third pair minutes um even though he got power play time so it'll be interesting but uh just to finish off too on your point with McDonald uh I totally agree on that just because you're looking at Hunter McDonald as a 22 year old um you know only drafted uh in 2022 sixth round pick hasn't even had a full season yet in pro hockey. My right. thought process is they're going to want to at least have him get one full year under his belt with the Phantoms before they graduate him up to the NHL. I mean, anything can happen. He could totally blow us away at training camp. Like who knows, but that would be, uh, I think the thought process and, to me, it looks like the Flyers are trying to be patient with their defensemen. Yeah, um, they, they don't want to rush. Yeah, they don't want to rush anybody. And usually with six round picks, they don't jump into the NHL right away, right? There's usually AHL time. So it's nothing that anybody should be um, kind of surprised by. Yeah, I think he's, he's, you really want the guy to be like at the AHL level playing 22 minutes a night, you know? Yeah, so we can do it there. 23 minutes a night, yeah. Earn it, right, at that level and then get the call up from that it's, point. It's not going to be that valuable you know, yeah. barring a bunch of injuries for the guy to come at this point in his pro career, like you were saying, to come to the NHL and play 15 minutes a night. And I also, Yuriv, I just can't see him jumping. Think about all the players you'd have to jump right. to be on the NHL roster. Like you're jumping Andre, you're jumping Zamula, you're jumping Yenning, you're jumping Adderd. You're even jumping potentially Samson, who played a full year with, you know, the Phantoms last season. So there's just yeah. so many players that might be ahead of him on the depth chart right now. Yeah, yeah, totally agree, man. All right, let's get into our grades. Um, this will be kind of the meat and potatoes of the of the episode, um, and then we'll get into the second half of the episode where we can have some fun off the cuff conversation. So, again, we're gonna follow last week's format. Um, we'll we'll go through the individual players at defense. Again, we're gonna do defense and goaltending today. We'll do defense first. Um, we'll go through each one of the players. Then we'll do an overall grade of the D. And then an overall grade of the penalty kill. We'll include that all together. And then we'll do the same thing with goaltender, go through each one of the players, um, and then um and then do an overall grade for <laughs> an overall grade for the uh the goaltending as well. Okay. First player on the list, and we're gonna go in alphabetical order here. Um, Ronnie Adderd. Um, and we'll switch off for silly like we did last week. Uh, so Ronnie Adder, uh, I gave him a C minus. Um, the reason I gave him a C minus and not a C, and I talked about this when I watched him play, is what I actually don't think he played poorly. So giving him a C minus is like kind of not that fair. He had two assists in 12 games. But what I really wanted to see more of from him, because I wouldn't necessarily say he played poorly, and he did get more ice time than Yinning. Um, but what I wanted to see more from him was using his offensive upside. And we talk about this a lot, right? It's like the expectation, you know, counts towards the grade. It's not the overall impact that the guy made. It's how did you perform to your expectations, to your specific role to the team? Um, and I just think, look, we needed a big time shooter. He did not supply that when he came up. He didn't have a long stretch. 12 games is not much. It's not that fair of a grade. But overall, that's really like I didn't think he played terrible defensively. I thought he did all right. Um, but I do think I wanted to see him like use his shot, right? Like that is his outside of his size, you know, he can skate. I like all that about him, but he's got a big time shot, and I never saw him try to use it once. Um, so that's why I kind of gave him the minus rather than just a regular C, um, is that I didn't see him play to his game specifically, where if you look at him playing in the Phantoms, that is a big reason why he is produced offensively is he's a big time shooter and he did not supply that at all. So that's where I kind of docked him half a, half a grade. 
just to be like, look, you were pretty much just even across the board as far as you were fine, but you didn't play confidently enough for me in the offensive game. So I docked him uh, half a grade there. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Like, uh, you gave him a C minus. I gave him a C plus. So we're pretty close. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, a, I'm a couple ahead. The main reason for me and just being a little more lenient is the fact that only 12 game sample size for him. Sure. Um, so it's tough to really, you know, know how he would have performed if it was a longer stretch. Um, not as much, you know, familiarity, obviously getting, getting used to, uh, you know, playing in John Tortorella's system, uh, which he didn't really have much experience with last season, only two games. Um, for me, I think the reason why he didn't get any higher is just ultimately there wasn't really a big impact that he had on the game, whether it be a negative and a positive factor, right? Like he didn't really make any huge glaring mistakes or anything that would make you be like, well, wow, like this is a D grade or he's really like negatively impacting the defense on every single shift. I even thought there was a couple of games where him and Jenning played really well. Like um, actually their first game in action against the Panthers, like the Flyers get a two on win over like one of the best teams in hockey um, with, you know, almost two rookies essentially entering the fold and they haven't played at all for the Flyers uh, so far at that point in the season. Uh, but I, I think you're spot on, your Eve, right? Like he's touted to be a more offensive type defenseman. Um, and in a stretch where the Flyers, you know, could have used some of that offense, he didn't really show a lot of that. But I think also that might be just a, or might be just due to the fact that he wasn't uh, so familiar um, with, you know, being up with the big club, sure. uh, just with the role that he was in. Um, just to, to look at it, right? Like his phantom stats were a lot better offensively um in 48 games with the phantoms he had 27 points so there is some offensive upside but to your point like we didn't see the big shot he didn't even score a goal so i think that's where the c grade c plus grade uh comes i didn't even see me. him really take a single slap shot in those 12 games yeah whereas i would argue his first stint back in 2021 22 that kind of ended the season i thought he was shooting way more often right, right. um Exactly. Under Mike Yo. So it's interesting, but yeah. And and again, you absolutely bring a fair point, you know, and, and I did consider that. Like, hey, you're up with a big club, you're trying to keep it simple. You know, slap shots do have a higher likelihood of creating odd man rushes, right? Because you Against, have to take yeah. right. Because you have to take that um, you know, that extra second, a half second or whatever to wind up. Um, but I thought he did have some opportunities to do it and he didn't. Um, so I just want to see him play more confidently. Um, I don't think he's that far away from like, I, I don't think a C plus is a, is a crazy grade for a guy who only got to play 12 games. Right. Um, but he is a little bit older. He's already 25 years old. So, you know, I consider that too. I'm like, you're not, you, you know, you're older than Zamula. So, you know, maturity wise, I do expect you to have some balls because I think he's a really good personality. I think his personality is fantastic, actually. And I think that's why the Flyers are high on him is also his attitude. Um, so I, I still have like hopes from him. I still think he can be an NHL player, um, like a number, like a good number six with, you know, two way play because he's got the size. He's got the size and the skating for it. So um, and he's been a late bloomer regardless. So, um I think my expectations were just a little bit higher. Okay, next player. Yeah, so next up is Jamie Drysdale. Um, I gave him a C. Mm -hmm. um, at least in my kind of estimation as to why I gave him a C, I think it's just the fact that he started off not hot, but like he started off showing so many flashes of his skill and then kind of tapered off from there. And we didn't really, um, not to say we didn't see it again. Cause we did see flashes, you know, certain situations in overtime where he's turning on the jets and really flying to the offensive zone, certain transitions up ice in certain games where he's flying in controlling the puck and really like making a skating ability, uh, known and showing how much of a plus skater that he actually can be here. Um, and then I guess, in a sense, a little bit harsh because after we look at the season, you know, a, a ton of injuries for him, right? Like he's going to get the hernia surgeries, uh, the sports hernia surgeries this um, off season, which obviously affected his play and his ability to play. Um, so maybe I'm a little harsh with the C. I just thought that you got to think about who the Flyers traded him for, their top prospect um, and Gautier at the time, or one of their top prospects, obviously Mitchkov's the top prospect. But um, just for, for the fact they're trading him for Gautier, I think, 
Um, Flyers fans and Flyers in general probably would have liked to see a little bit more offense out of him. Like you only get 10 points out of him in 34 games. He's supposed to be a, a, you know, an offensive defenseman. Um, I do think though, with, you know, a full off season to recover from those injuries, um, obviously it's going to take time with the sports hernia. Sometimes it can take up to six months to really fully recover. But I think once he gets a full recovery and then being able to train, um, you know, adequately moving into, you know, upcoming seasons i think that'll really help his game so for me i gave him a c and reason being is just we didn't see uh, enough of that offensive and dynamic ability but obviously injuries played a factor but I, I think for drysdale we'll see more of that come out as the seasons go along more of his offensive game i'm sure the skating didn't help or the or the injuries didn't help his skating anyway yeah no i'm i'm right there with you i gave him a c as well for the exact same reasons that you said um, again, he put up five points in 10 games for Anaheim and then put up five points in 24 games for the Flyers. Uh, he was a minus 18, uh, with the Flyers this year. And I think, again, a lot of, if I remember a lot of those minuses came after the injury, um, especially when they had those, that really bad stretch where they were unable to win games and, uh, him and Sealer just weren't really connecting as a pairing, you know, and he was kind of like losing battles. I don't think that's the player he is. Um, but, you know, we brought him in to fix the power play, theoretically. Uh, he did in the beginning, like puck movement was much better with him. But then obviously, you know, after the injury and, and whatnot, everything just kind of tailed off. So with expectations being so high of him, I couldn't give him anything higher than a C. I mean, maybe even a C minus would be appropriate, but because of the injury... Um, I kept it at a C. Um, I still am very high on the guy, and that's why I'm we're so disappointed because the skill is clearly there. Um, the vision, the skating, all of that is clearly there. So uh, I don't. I'm not. Um, I still believe he's got top pairing number one potential, but uh, I think he just needs a healthy season to kind of prove it. Uh, all right. Next on the list is Adam Yinning. Uh, I gave Yinning a C. Uh, as well. Uh, Yinning, I thought, actually defensively looked better than Adderd. Um, Two-way wise, wasn't very effective, but he was physical. And this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. He did play his game. I think he actually can be better than what he played. I've seen him play better at the NHL level. I thought he had actually some games, especially that game against Florida. I thought he played really well uh, against Florida. And that's where I would like to see him um, be able to make an NHL spot and i think he actually still has nhl potential for sure that's why i don't think he should run to the shl so quickly even if it doesn't work out with the flyers because i think he kind of reminds me of luke shen in a lot of ways um just the build the way he moves um the fact that he's like in the way and if you look at luke shen like a lot of these defensive defensemen a lot of them don't bloom till the second half of their 25 and up so I'm like, dude, you're right on the precipice right now of being that guy who's stronger than people, gets him in the corner. So I really didn't, I couldn't give him a better grade than a C, even though he played nine games. You know, he had one goal. Um, you know, he just didn't really play that much, and he didn't play that much uh, on the penalty kill either. Like, Adder played more than him on the penalty kill. So um, I couldn't give him anything more than a C. Um, but I thought he was in, in the type of player he is being a defensive defenseman. Um, I thought he looked like a defensive defenseman at the NHL level. So that's why I kept him at a regular C and didn't dock him any extra points. Cause I'm like, okay, you did what I wanted you to do, which was be in the way block shots, hit people at some big hits. Um, again, that game against Florida, if he can replicate that more often, I think he's an NHL player. Yeah, I, I agree uh, pretty much 100% on what you said with Jenning. I have a, a little bit higher, um, given the exact same grade as Adderd, uh, okay. C+, plus, just for the same reason that it's it's hard to judge a guy who's only getting nine games. But for those nine games, if you look at what his role is, what he's supposed to be, what he's supposed to do, I mean, obviously there was a couple of mistakes, a couple of defensive breakdowns that's going to happen, um, especially when you're making your debut in the NHL like he was. I mean, he only had one game in 2022-23, nine games this season, so really he's a rookie. Um, but yeah, he played like a defensive defenseman should, right? Like he wasn't taking a lot of chances. He was um, tough on the puck, hard hard on board battles in terms of moving uh, him off pucks and and usually you'd win those battles um, majority of the time. I mean, he is a big guy, 6'3". 
once again, I think ideally the Flyers would like him to put some weight on. Like he's 6'3, but listed only as 196 pounds, at least on hockey DB. Um, so I'm not sure if that's accurate, but um, if so, I'm sure they'd want him to bulk up a little bit there, um, just based off his size. But I I thought his ability just to kill plays, right, with his size. There was a lot of situations in front of the net where he was clearing the net well. Um, you know, getting the puck out of the zone when needed. That's what you need for a defense from a defensive defense, but you don't want really anything flashy. I don't think it's ever really going to be his game to be a big, you know, offensive contributor contributor or anything like that. So it's more just about the defensive gameplay, his ability to, um, you know, keep things kind of shut down defensively, not break things down, um, not get beat um, in front of his own net or get beat out wide um, just due to his size. So, yeah, for a big guy too, he didn't really look flat footed or anything like that. Um, you could keep up with the play. So um, I think Yinning will probably get games next season. I wouldn't be surprised um, for him maybe to be kind of like a seven number seven type role, even um, who knows, right. If he earns that, but uh, yeah, that's why you get to see plus for me. He, you know, lived up to those defensive defenseman type of expectations. No really huge glaring mistakes or anything like that. I just think for him to get any of a higher grade, you, you'd have to play more than nine games for us to really judge it and kind of really see. So next season, hopefully we'll get to see a, a bit of that and, and a bit of what it looks like. But yeah, C plus for me for Jenny. Yeah, and I also should add that he had no penalty minutes um, in that, guy that big. That's yeah. pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also realized that we don't have Louis Belpedio on this list, so maybe we'll do him at the end. Just something, something to think about. He did yep. play 27 games with the team this year, so or I'm sorry, uh, 12 games with the C team this year. So maybe yeah, if we'll... we're gonna grade, if we're gonna grade these guys right. 12 and nine, we might as well add one in for him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, okay. So next up, we have Eric yep. Johnson. Um, and Johnson came to the team pretty late, uh, trade deadline edition. Um, I gave him a C. And at least for me and what I saw from Johnson, um, you know, he didn't play bad. Like he played 17 games for the Flyers. There was a couple of times where in his own end actually made some really great plays um, to break up other teams' chances offensively, whether it be, you know, a lot of diving plays. I remember a couple of two-on-ones where he was diving and breaking plays up, uh, making some good, you know, plays with his stick. Obviously, he's a veteran. I mean, the guy was a first overall pick in the 26 2006 NHL uh, draft. So, you know, he's been around for a long time uh, at this point, like almost 20 years. Uh, if he ends up playing till 2026. So it's kind of crazy about 18 seasons in the league for him. But obviously even he would tell you, right. He knows that it's kind of the end of the road for him. He's kind of a depth defenseman at this point. So I think for a depth defenseman, like he did give the flyer some solid shifts there were times, though, where when he was playing a little higher than that third pair, he would get exploited, right? And I think a lot of that was just due to um, flat-footedness, where you could tell as his career is going along here, he's definitely lost some speed, lost some mobility on the back end. And I think there were certain plays for sure where, um, if I remember correctly, it was him and Mark Stahl paired together. And that was just a pair that was very slow on the ice, obviously, um, two older guys. So they would get beat out lot or out wide a lot with speed, um, especially when they were paired together. Uh, so for me, like Johnson didn't play terribly. There were some, you know, big mistakes defensively that cost the flyers, but he also had some plays where he would, you know, break up offensive chances where the other team could have scored some goals. So almost, you know, a 50, 50 type performance for, for him where, I would say about half the games, he was pretty solid, not giving up a lot. Um, and then the other half, you know, some chances against. But when you're at his age and kind of where he's at in his career in terms of his mobility, his skill set, um, if you're going to play him above a third pairing role, you have to expect that there's going to be, um, could be some chances against, um, at least from an offensive standpoint for the other team. So that's why uh, Johnson gets the C for me. How about you, Yuri? I gave Johnson a C plus. Um I thought his attitude was exceptional. Um, yeah, that's one thing I didn't mention. Like, just his, his attitude, his actual, like, you know, ro locker room presence, I'm his sure. His gravitas, you yes, know? Exactly. Um, he definitely has that in strides, which is why I can understand the thought to even bring him back as a number seven. I think considering he played out of position on a brand new team when a team was struggling, uh, and I thought he got much better as the season went on with the Flyers, so, like, the first half wasn't that great just because the team was kind of in chaos. 
But then by the end, he was one of the more reliable defensemen in a, in a limited role. I think that's where he needs to be playing in a limited role. It just kind of reminded me how Mark Streit kind of played for us in a very limited role. And then when he got escalated, you know, he didn't do well. Um, but I, I really think that Johnson, with some actual preparation with Tortorella, and maybe he'll get worse next year too, which is possible. Something definitely the Flyers need to consider. Um, I did really like what he brought this year. So that's why I gave him a C plus because uh, I gave him the plus because I'm like, you know what? Like overall, I actually really like the addition and the fact that he kind of bumped stall out of there immediately kind of reflected that, that, you know, he would have been an upgrade over stall all year long. And I think if he was here all season, I think we probably would have given him a higher grade. Um, and I thought he started playing kind of better and better. And I thought by the end of the season, he looked like a guy I'd be like, okay, like this guy can be in the lineup in a, in a limited role, especially being rotated in like a number seven would be ideal. And the way he handled his exit interview was like, it, it, I'm like, I totally get why you're a captain, you know, even listening to you for five minutes. I'm like, totally get it. I, I, I totally see it. I can see how younger players would view a guy like that in the locker room or even, you know, just coming in every now and then being there at practice. Um, he just seems to have a great personality, um, and a high leadership caliber. And he would just, you know, he always laid out his body. He was, you know, always trying to, trying to make the play. I do think he's a little slow foot to a detriment at this point at times, but if you put him with somebody who can really skate, like if, if it's a bottom pairing of Johnson and Andrea next year, I think, you know, I'm a lot more comfortable with that than, you know, yeah. Andrea and like Adderd. Or something like that. Well, yeah, jo Johnson could cover for him a bit defensively, but I I do agree. Like I think he would be a perfect type of number seven, just with the leadership qualities he brings. Yeah. So many young guys around the defense, it would definitely be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to the next guy. Uh, also, another guy with a limited showing. It's like you look at the amount of defense. Half the D man, yeah, yeah. So Rasmus Ristolainen, um, he only played thirty one games this year. I gave Risto a C. Um, and I think that's even a little bit low because I actually think he played really well at times this year, but the, but there are also times where he was a little invisible. And I think quite frankly, it's just cause he was dealing with an injury and my expectations of him from the previous year were relatively high. So I couldn't give him anything higher than a C cause I'm like, I know you're better than you're playing, but I also recognize that you were playing all year injured. So it's kind of yeah. like a wash. Like the fact that he even played 31 games is like, you, you like think about it, you're like he did. You know what I mean? Like, I thought it was less to be honest. Right, exactly. Because he like, he like came back and then would sit out again. They would come back and he would sit out again. You could tell he was kind of struggling with that injury. So I can't really give him a better grade than a C, but I also can't really knock him because I know that he was injured all year round. So like, even if he's, if, if he does not get moved in this off season, I am not upset because I actually think that Rasmus Ristolainen's value is higher than people's perception of it. Um, and I, I actually get why um, GMs like him. Yeah. Um, and I think if he can be healthy, which he has had some injury problems here, um, I think if he can be healthy and play a whole season, I think he, not only can he put up more points, but I think he can play solid D. And I do think he can be a top four defender in the NHL still today. Um, so I gave him a C. Yeah, in my opinion, I think the prior season, like 2022-23, really showed that he could be uh, a defensive asset and could really play at that second pair level. Yeah. I think he definitely could be a second pair defenseman. It's just about now if he can stay healthy, because even if you look at the past couple seasons with the Sabres as well, like he did have injuries with them too. Mm -hmm. He's never, he hasn't really played a full 82 game season ever since 2015. Um, so it shows, right? Like a big guy like that. It's not really surprising to me that he's had a lot of injuries because he does play a real physical game. Uh, but yeah, I was on the same exact page with you, Yuri. I gave him a C. Um, and the main reason is just lack of availability for me. Like I didn't think he played poorly at all when he did play. Um, he was similar defensively this season in the 31 games, right? No huge glaring mistakes. Wasn't a guy looking for the big hit like he did previously when he used to play for Buffalo. Like you could see whatever Bradshaw and John Tortorella kind of, um, implemented with him on a defensive standpoint last season. He did carry that over this season. Um, I would say that for his size, he didn't look as quick to me. 
um, this season. I think the injury probably plays a factor there, right? Like I think getting to pucks, getting to pucks first, he was really good at that last season, especially with his size, very intimidating factor. I didn't see the quickness as much, but the injury probably plays an effect. Um, only gets the four points. And I think to your point, um, there was times where he wasn't visible. He wasn't as noticeable. I think the injury plays an effect, but at least for me and Ristolainen and the kind of game that he's playing, I think if you're a defenseman of his nature, um, actually being invisible is a good thing, right? Like if you're not seeing him jump off the page, you know, making egregious mistakes, running out of position to make hits, that's probably a good thing. That means he's playing solid defensively. He's getting those pucks out, moving the puck up ice. And then sometimes, you know, you'll see him kind of jump in offensively a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I think really the lack of availability, especially in a stretch where, you know, the Flyers needed him, right? Like they had so many injuries, trade away Sean Walker. They really could have used him, um, you know, in February, uh, in March, um, you know, in April leading up to the stretch drive. So I think just the fact that they're paying him, you know, 5.5 million and he wasn't able to really get back into the lineup after February 10th when the Flyers could have really used him. I think that's where the C comes uh, for me because even though we can't control an injury as a player, right, your lack of availability um, is a detriment, right? So, yep. you know, he um, going forward at least needs to make sure that he's healthy so the Flyers can uh, use him going forward. Um, so that's why he gets the C for me, just not being healthy enough. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going uh, next up here. Um, and I have Travis Sandheim um, and Travis Sandheim for me. Uh, amazing season. Like if you just look at where he was last season, probably one of his worst seasons, potentially getting traded. And then that trade getting nixed due to Tory Krug not uh, waving his no trade clog, tr no trade clause, um, excuse me. But yeah, Sandheim had a killer year. Um, he got an A for me. Um, and just a ton of reasons, right? Like it's his first real season, you could say, where he was used as a top uh, pairing defenseman and he handled it really, really well. Um, obviously, who knows how a defenseman like that is going to handle um, getting those top pair minutes. Obviously, he's been put in those situations before, but usually those minutes were going to Ivan Provorov and whoever his partner was. So he's never really the guy that was taking on the best competition on a nightly basis. And for a player who had his worst career year ever last season, uh, not in terms of you know points or anything, but just in terms of his overall play getting scratched, just the overall discourse for him to bounce back in that way, especially playing against top line level talent, which he really hasn't gone up against before. That's you know why he gets the A for me. Um, also, um, you know, career year in terms of goals, career year in terms of assists, career year in terms of points, where you know, 44 points to 81 games, and even to end the season, he was quite hampered. Like we you could tell he was injured. And he was still playing against those top lines and faring well, still putting up points down the stretch, even though he was hurt. Um, so I think down the line here, right? Like I could, I wouldn't be surprised to see him hit the 50 point mark. If he can continue and follow up and continue to play this well and um, not, you know, get injured to end the year and like having to play through an injury. So I think just all those factors for me is why Sandheim gets an A and even an increased um, just ability defensively. Right. I, I think this was probably his, most um effective season actually defensively in his own end breaking up plays things like that and that has to go to his work ethic right he put on a ton of weight this offseason got himself up to 222 pounds where before as a 6'4 defenseman he was around the 200 mark so adding that weight adding that extra size really helped him close off plays um you know get pucks out win those board battles so i just think from a defensive standpoint um he was really good and then offensive standpoint obviously career year so that's why he gets the a for me yeah, so I, I gave him an A minus. Um yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I thought he was the backbone of the team's defense this year. I mean, it showed in the uh award given to him. Uh I think a lot of people were by the end kind of forgetting how consistent he was this year. And I think if he didn't get that injury, he probably would have hit fifty points. I don't think he would have been minus twenty. Yeah. Um if the again, power play was decent at all, too. Yeah, yeah, well, for sure. Um I, I just think he was so crucial to this team performing the way they did. And in the first half of the year, he was an A+. Plus. Um, he was phenomenal in the first yeah. half of the year. Uh, like, one of the best defensemen in the league, phenomenal. Um, I thought he dropped off in the second half of the year. That's why I gave him an A-, just because of the injury, some of the drop-offs. I thought he finished really strong. 
Um, but overall, it's the Sandheim we were hoping we were going to get when we drafted him. Um, and he is looking like that top pairing defenseman. And, you know, I said a few years ago when Seth Jones was available that I wouldn't offer more than Travis Sandheim. And really, this this was why. Um, because they were trying to get rid of that. I mean, I would offer like draft picks on top of that, but I've been like, you know, uh, you're getting a guy who is an, uh, in the top three defenseman, and he was, you know, in his early 20s at the time, mid 20s. Um, so, you know, I, I just think he was so good at times this year. I think people kind of soured on him a little bit. And I yeah. think the fact he was playing like 30 minutes a night at times. Um, I don't think he's like a 30 minute a night defenseman. I think he's, you know, somewhere between 24, 25 minutes, which is he played just under 24 minutes a night. I think he was being overplayed and he suffered a little bit from that. Um, but I thought he had a really strong year and I think he can build on it. Like you said, I think he can do even better. And hopefully he he does at least what he did this year next year because we're going to need him because he was arguably the most important player on the back end for the Flyers. And obviously we'll get to the other one. Um, but well, no, I, too, just to add, Yuri, yeah, like he had 16 points in his first 21 games. Just shows how... Right much of an impact yet offensively. I really think that injury hampered him. And if you're a player and you're a defenseman, let's say you're not going to, especially when you're injured, you're not going to want to try to push it up the ice. He's probably no knows he's hampered. He's probably focusing more on the defensive play, yeah. making sure he's, you know, can take care of his own end. So I think yeah. that really probably hampered him a bit offensively. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully he's a hundred percent, which I imagine he will be to start next season. Yeah. Cause no surgeries or anything. It's just right. more like a nagging, injury which yeah yeah no totally uh, i just thought he was so good in the beginning of the year like i was like is he gonna be fighting for a norris this year the way if he playing? kept that pace up of like 16 yeah. and 21 games i think he would have yeah yeah the way he was playing was by far the best he's ever looked um and i i'm really hoping he can get back to that point next on the list Number seven on the list nick sealer uh this was my highest grade i gave him an a um I, I want to give him an A plus, but he struggled a little bit uh, when he was playing with Jamie Drysdale after his injury uh, as well. Um, so I had to dock him half a half a grade. But considering he is a bottom pairing defenseman and played in the top four at such a high clip, especially when him and Sean Walker were just on it this year, um, I just thought he was absolutely phenomenal for our expectations of him and his role for the team. He is everything you want in a bottom pairing defensive defenseman, like the ability to hop up, the ability to play against the better players on the opposite team, the ability to be physical, to be just a complete motor, to to fight when needed. Like he is such a useful player and really, really proved to be that this year. Um, I just thought he was great, you know, and and I was thinking that last year when we were talking about getting rid of him, I was like, do we really want to get rid of this guy? Like, I know people want to just replace every veteran with a young guy. I don't really agree with that because uh, we're also developing forwards and you need rel reliability on the back end to do those things. And he just, at, at points in this season, he was an A+. Plus. Um, and uh, really just docked him a little bit just, just because he suffered a little bit in his game this year. But um, again, he was a plus nine at the end of the year. You know, a lot of his penalty minutes were fighting. Um, you know, over aggression, played played a good amount of time on the penalty kill, and you know, just the coaches really believed in him, and that's and it's obvious as to why. Um, and he deserved it, and for being a bottom pairing defenseman, uh, I thought he was exceptional. He only played seventy one games this year, but I expect him to play all eighty two games normally. Um, he's just a workhorse of a guy, and uh, deserved the contract that he got. Yeah, so Sealer um is getting my. I guess second, third highest grade. I uh, gave him an A minus. So okay. I wanted to give him the A, but I just think those that little stretch um, with Drysdale where he didn't really see him play to the capabilities that we know he can uh, made me dock him just a little bit off the A. And I think, to be honest with you, if Sean Walker was not traded and he played with him all season, I think that chemistry would have never been a problem. He probably would have got an A. Yeah. I think with Drysdale, just learning a new partner new chemistry it was kind of tough for both of them but to your point right like for the money that they're paying sealer and for the role that he's supposed to be in he just you know went above and beyond what you could have expected for a defenseman that you're 
thinking is going to be a third pair defenseman where really like he played essentially almost as like a, a second pair all season, right? Like there were certain um, times where he was getting, uh, you know, 19, 18, even 20 minutes a night. Um, and I think if you would have brought that up to anybody years ago to say, oh, Nick Sealer could potentially be playing, you know, 20 minutes a night on the flyers and be having a positive impact. I think people would have called you nuts, right? So just looking at that and just his overall kind of progression, right? Because you got to think about it like, only a few seasons ago, this guy wasn't even in the NHL. Like he retired from hockey. So for him to come back from, you know, that kind of um, situation where the guy wasn't even playing um, in the NHL to a point where, you know, he's playing as a second pair defenseman for a team that's in the playoff hunt and was in a, a you know, a playoff spot for majority of the season. I think, yeah, kudos to him and definitely deserves the A minus. And yeah, it was his highest season um, or Highest season in terms of time on ice um, in the NHL for Sealer. He had an average 16.57 time on ice, and that's considerably more than his second highest, which is 14 minutes, 29 seconds. So, you know, played around that second uh, pairing level uh, in terms of just time on ice, the minutes given, and also got a factors in, factor in his effect on the penalty kill, right? Like, Flyers had a top penalty kill um, this season, and he was a big part of that played a lot of minutes on the pk and then the last thing for me for sealer um and why he gets the a minus just to block shots right like fifth in the yeah, league this season point. fifth in the league uh and block shots this season with 205 uh the only players ahead of him were chris tanev and Braden mcnab who had 207 that was tied for third marit cider tw uh 213 and then uh colton pareko uh tops in the league 218 but you have to factor in right like pareko 82 games played cider 82 games played mcnab 82 games played tanev 76 um sealer only 71 so I, I would have to believe just the way he was blocking shots that uh this past season if he would have played the full 82 he would have definitely surpassed 218 and probably been tops of the league um so just crazy with just his ability to kind of throw it all on the line block shots um and just really give us all also the leadership too, right? Like how many times have we heard that his leadership ability is just bringing the team together kind of getting the guys fired up. So just all that for me is why sealer gets an a minus just an outstanding season for a guy that you're not really expecting that right for a third pair defenseman. You're not expecting him to step up in that way. The fact the flyers know that, Hey, you know, if somebody gets hurt, he could step up in that second pair role and, and be effective with the right partner. Um, so that's an asset to have for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, and then next up on the list, uh, we have Mark Stahl. Um, unfortunately for Stahl, he's getting my lowest grade. Um, he's getting a D plus, And it's really just not, it's not anything against him because uh, obviously a really great guy, um, you know, a leader in the locker room, a guy that helped a lot of the young players this season, especially if you look at, you know, the exit interviews and even talking to some of the players, right? They said that Stahl was a calming factor for them, just being a veteran, kind of being there before being in competitive games. But just if you look at the on ice, uh, that's where the D plus comes in for me, right? Like as an off ice leader, I think Stahl did a great job. But just on on the ice, right? He There was just certain times where uh, the lack of speed, I think was really noticeable. Like if he was out against any other teams like top two lines, you would really get exposed. Whereas, you know, against the bottom two lines or bottom pairings and things like that, he could hold his own. But if he was playing anything more than like, you know, 10, 12 minutes a night, you really saw him get exposed with the lack of speed and, you know, being able uh, to beat him out wide just due to the fact that uh, the acceleration just isn't there at this point in his career. Um, surprisingly enough though, I, he was a plus two this season. Uh, which is interesting. Obviously, that's why that stat is kind of misleading. Sometimes you're on the ice for certain goals. You know, you just step off, a goal gets scored against. But I just think defensively, there was a lot of breakdowns when he was on the ice um, overall. Uh, and that's what led to the D-plus for me for Stahl. Yeah, I gave him a D-plus as well. I thought he was exposed, uh, especially in the second half of the year. He was yeah. uh, almost completely... As the ice time increased, right? Yeah, almost completely ineffective uh, in the second half of the year. So that's why... I didn't give him just like a normal C grade. Um, you know, again, I agree with everything you said, you know, the, the intangibles of him being around the team. I, you know, I see that value there, but I had to consider the fact that Eric Johnson kind of walked in here and took his spot away. 
Um, and when they played together, it was brutal. What a mistake to put the two of them together. I don't know what the heck the coaching staff was thinking on that one, um, to put two def highly defensive, you know, immobile defensemen together um, without the ability to complement one another. But um, I do think he had some really good flashes in a very limited role early. Um, but as the season wore on, it's just, it kind of became obvious that he needs to retire. So, uh, couldn't give him anything higher than a D plus. And I give him a D plus just because he was serviceable at times this year and not, that's why I didn't go lower on him. Uh, okay. Next on the list, uh, the former flyer, Sean Walker. Um, I gave him an A minus, uh, Sean Walker, Completely exceeded everybody's expectations. Um, again, Vasily was one of the only people uh, talking about his potential to play a top four role. He not only played a top four role, but he did it in style this year. He scored very important goals for the Flyers. While he didn't put up a ton of points, he did have a 29-point season overall, but he put up 22 points in 63 games for the Flyers. But it was the way he put up points, the fact that he was able to jump in on the power play, jump in on the penalty kill, um, play phenomenally at five on five with Nick Sealer. Um, and clearly Sealer, you know, relied on Walker's play. Um, so I give him an A minus just because I think people I kept hearing he was the best defenseman on the Flyers. I heard that way too many times. I never thought uh, at any point this season he was the best player uh, or best defenseman on the Flyers. I think it was easily Travis Sandheim. Um, I think people are undervaluating out, undervaluing what he was giving, but for the expectation for the role that the guy was brought into play, he played absolutely phenomenally. Um, and obviously, getting us that first round pick proved that. Um, you know, probably normally without us eating um, the money on uh, Johansson, we would have probably got a second round pick for him. Um, but that also is a testament to how good he played this year. Um, you know, he he just played really, really well. And I think he revitalized his career uh, in a yeah. lot of ways. And he's a player I'd be open if the Flyers did manage to get rid of Risto. He's a guy I'd, I'd love to replace him with. Um, he's just not a guy I would want, like, term on. Um, and I suspect he probably will get term. But um, I really liked what I saw from Sean Walker. I thought he was heroic at times this year. And I think that's what stuck out to people, why people kept saying he was the best defenseman on the team. Again, I don't overvalue analytics. I don't really, I, I don't go by that as my measurement of whether a player is good or not. Um, it's just retrospective data. So uh, the way I kind of look at it is like Sean Walker did a great job in the role that he was in for. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm on the same page uh, with you with Walker. Um, I gave him an A minus as well. And reason being, at least for the A minus, is just think about where he was in his career um, last off season. Really, just being a throw in and a deal. Nobody even thought that hey, this guy could have a big top four role in the team and fetch another first round pick for you. And that's what ends up happening. Um, he kind of, like you said, revitalized his career. But I don't think, at least in NHL circles, I don't think that anybody ever thought that he wasn't an NHL defenseman. I just think that injuries kind of shoved him out in yeah. LA. And they had younger guys coming up and that kind of replaced his role, right? And then he had to come to the Flyers and kind of show that, okay, after the injury, I could still be a valuable piece, which he definitely was. Um, he had a career year in terms of points, um, 29 points between the Flyers and the Avs split. His highest ever in the past was 24 points and 70 games with the Kings in 2019-20. And also, it's a bounce back for him um, just in terms of... Um, you know, being healthy, right? Because he, uh, I believe, played in every single game this season. Might have missed one or two, but it's been one of his his healthiest seasons. Uh, because his previous high uh, in terms of game play, games played was seventy, so he he definitely surpassed the seventy mark there. And just I think the way he fit in stylistically with the Flyers, um, is why I really gave him the A minus. Like, mm -hmm. I say he was a perfect fit, but just the way that. He was able to transition the puck up ice very quickly, his outlet passing, knowing when to jump in the rush and kind of when to lay back. Like yep. that, that style the Flyers are trying to implement, just kind of moving the puck up quickly, capitalizing off those rush chances. Like he fit in perfectly to that. And there wasn't really ever uh, any real egregious mistakes on his part defensively either. Yeah. Also had a PK role too. So just all those factors for me um, is why Walker gets the A minus. And then also, you know, being able to turn him into a first round pick. I don't know if that counts into his player grade, but just the fact that he played well enough that other teams even recognize how good he was uh, for, you know, 
him to kind of fetch that. I think that's a, a big reason for me too. And last thing is um, he did have his highest time on ice um, of his career, um, at least for the Flyers. Um, he averaged um, in the 60, 63 games um, for the Flyers. Um, he averaged a total of 19 minutes, 36 seconds. Um, and then for the, for the uh, avalanche, he was getting 17, uh, 57. So even for the abs, right. He was playing that top four type minutes. So he's definitely established himself again as a bona fide like top four defenseman i he's probably going to get the biggest contract he's ever gotten in his career this yeah. offseason and it's well deserved right a guy that was essentially counted out like people thought of him maybe being even a seventh defenseman on this team which is crazy if you look at where he ended up and how he played and um arguably was a number three for the flyers all season and uh played in that number three role uh very well so yeah. He, you know, he had a great year for the Flyers, and that's why uh, he gets that uh, A minus grade for me there. Yeah, well said. Yeah, next up, um, we have Cam York, and second highest uh, grade, or I guess tie uh, with me. I gave him an A, uh, similar to Sanheim. Um, York really just showing progression from a year to year basis, right? Like, I want to look at it this way. So, 21 22, York plays 30 games, gets 10 points. Um, 2022-23 plays 54 games gets 20 points this season plays the full 82 gets 30 points so you can see on a year-to-year -year basis incrementally he's gone up 10 points every single season uh this is the first season he played a full year in the nhl of um you know 82 games um 10 goals up again from the prior two seasons that he played 54 30 games right like that's a career high for him career high in assists career high in goals career high in points uh for a defenseman that's only 23 uh, years old and a guy playing top minutes essentially every night um basically top pk minutes as well uh york really um you know surprised me in a sense that he was ready for that role right i wasn't sure if he was going to be a bona fide okay we can put him in on the top pair you don't really have to worry about it. it didn't really start off that way like he did start off getting less minutes but then really him and Sandheim were a pair essentially the whole season and you know he wasn't a guy that they really moved and there was even a point in the year where he was getting more minutes than Sandheim and almost even playing that number one role when Sandheim was kind of dealing with those injuries York really stepped up and played well and I think in big games he showed you know um some great um, play as well, right? Like he, there wasn't really, like I said, any egregious mistakes from him. And he was really stepping up on those big uh, moments. Um, and even when the team needed him, when a guy, when a guy like Sandheim was a bit banged up, but just to show as well, right. Even more improvement. Like he was averaging last season, 1939 uh, time on ice. And this season up to 2022, 37 time on ice. Um, so yeah, York just, obviously was a guy that really um surprised me not in the sense that he never had the skill but i just wasn't sure if he was going to be a guy you could put up against those top line opponents every single night uh and he was doing that and to end the season like this is crazy i'm going to go through the game log from march 16th just look at the time on ice so march 16th against boston flyers lose 6-5 27 minutes time on ice next game against the Leafs, 26 minutes next game against Carolina, 29 against Boston, 25 against Florida, 29 minutes against New York, 27 minutes against Montreal, 28 minutes against Chicago, 24 minutes. Um, and then the last, um, let's see, seven games of the season. There wasn't a game where he was under 22 minutes and most of them were 25, 26. So the guy was just getting used. Um, like a number one, like a top pair defenseman. And I didn't think he looked out of place to me. So, yeah. Um, well said. I gave Cam York a B plus. Uh, I thought the second half of his season, he was in that A territory. Uh, the first half, I think he was, you know, probably in like the lower B. Uh, my expectations of Cam York are still really high. Um, I believe he will be a top pairing defenseman. I think he's already playing like one right yes, now. Yeah. The reason I didn't give him an A overall, though, is just the fact the power play was so bad, and I know he can be a power play quarterback, um, at least to an extent, at least second pairing, and he only had six power play points, so I docked him a little bit there. Um, I didn't think he did a great job on the power play, and that's where I was like kind of disappointed with him this year. Um, but overall, I mean, I, my opinion of Cam York is that he's going to be a 50-plus point defenseman playing top pairing minutes. Um, yeah. And he showed that he can do that. Um, and he also scored some big goals for the team, too, at times this year. 
Um, but I really want to see more production offensively on the power play. And I think that's where his offensive game lacked this year. The 10 goals, great. Um, I think he can do even better than that. And uh, yeah, again, we got to give it more time. Um, but I think he's going to be one of those guys that's going to be, you know, kind of, you know, he's going to be our Ryan Ellis that we were hoping, you know, Ryan Ellis would be for us. Um, yeah. I think Cam York is going to end up filling that that role here in the long term. And next year, um, quite frankly, I expect a better year out of him. Um, I agree. I think he'll be more productive offensively, hopefully better on the power play. But yeah. even too, like he was playing with some injuries as well, like yep. played through an injury, didn't winner classic, didn't miss a game, like just shows um, the toughness. I, I don't think a lot of fans and even a lot of people – um, that might have scouted him in the past. He was known more to be an offensive guy, like with USN TDP. I don't think people realize how um, effective he is actually overall as a defenseman and how tough he is too yeah. as a defenseman. I think yeah. that's an underrated part of his game for sure. Yeah, he's mentally tough. And obviously the block, shot blocking went up considerably in the second half of the year. So second half of the year, he was like great. Um, yeah, he stepped it up, man, especially with um, Sandheim kind of on the men with a couple of injuries, you could yep. see he really elevated his game and took those extra minutes. Right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, number 11 on the list, uh, second to last defenseman. Again, we added Belpedio. We'll do him at the end. Um, Igor Zamula. Uh, I gave Zamula a B minus. Um, I thought his offensive production for a rookie was very good. Um, not very good, may even be a little bit strong. I thought he suffered a little bit defensively at times. I also think he got like the brunt end of, of some of Tortorella's like, you know, frustration. But I think Tortorella ends up being right a lot of times. Um, we just don't notice it as much as he does. Uh, he's not perfect. I don't think Tortorella's criticism is always like 100% on point. But let's give him the 80% odds here. Um, I do think Zamula needs to work on his two-way game a little bit. I need, I think he needs to work on his strength, but there are times where he played really, really well. Um, he was in limited minutes, and when you kind of raised his minutes, he suffered. But if he's like a bottom-pairing defenseman who's putting up you know, 35 points a year, um, for a guy who's undrafted, I think that's actually pretty great. Um, and he stepped up on the power play at times. I, I was still a little confused why they were so high on him on the power play because I didn't necessarily think he was great on the power play. Um, but considering how terrible the power play was and the fact that he just brought like simplicity on the power play, I think helped. Um, he just kind of kept it simple and, you know, made the right passes and that yeah, pucks on that was. The big yeah. Thing that he yeah. Would try, so. Yeah. But, you know, again, a game of B minus because his offensive production was there. He was also a plus player I, at times this year. He played really well, um, but just not consistent enough for me to give him a higher grade than a B minus. No, that's a fair grade. Um, Zamula for me was just a notch uh, lower. Um, he got a C plus. Um, a lot of the same points as you, right? For him, like I think at certain points he really showed his strengths. At certain points, he really showed his weaknesses. I I don't think he's ever going to be that defensive stalwart. Like he's going to be the offensive minded guy on a pairing where you put him with a guy that's a little more defensively stable, yeah. but I think there is room for him to improve defensively. And mainly that's just due to his size, right? He's a real, he's a pretty big guy at six, three, but only 200 pounds. I thought for his size, there's a lot of times where he was getting walked by smaller guys where he should have put the body on them or um, he was in board battles, losing those battles to smaller players when, you know, you're the bigger guy, you should be winning that battle. So I think that's kind of where some of the deficiencies come in for me that, um, you know, just defensively, there were some spots where I thought he, especially with his size, could have played things better and really should have been losing those battles. But offensively, he was a real big surprise, like 21 points in 66 games. I think if he plays, you know, the full season, 82, he might even get the 30 points almost in his rookie year as a defenseman, which I mean, it's not too shabby for a guy who's undrafted. So yeah. I think the offensive upsides there, um, I think he can continue to help the Flyers like transitionally like he moves the puck up well can enter the zone and carry the puck up well and kind of you know give space to himself with his size i think really what the flyers will want to improve on with zamula's defensive side of things i think there's a lot to clean up there just in terms of like positioning winning board battles being more decisive i think there was points where he'd get the puck and it's almost like he didn't know what he was doing with it and then we'd get stripped or turn it over i think that's a big thing too uh but that's why zamula gets a c plus for me i expect um you know we'll see him improve next season right he's still a young guy still a young player yeah yeah totally uh okay number 12 last one on the list louis belpedio um he easily forgotten because he only really 
he only played in the first half of the year uh, when the Flyers did have some injuries, but uh, I gave him a B minus. Um, I thought he was great. Uh, again, two goals, two assists. Um, he played a very limited role, so I didn't want to give him too much, you know, of a high grade just because he didn't have that much pressure on him. Um, but I was shocked he never got called up again, to be honest with you. I, th I actually thought when the team was struggling, I was kind of in my mind, I was like, why are we not playing Belpedio instead of like stall right now? Uh, maybe because his role was too large for the Phantoms. But um, I thought Belpedio looked like an NHL defenseman in the 12 games that he was here. Um, so I thought he actually had a really good season and he reminded me of like a poor man, Sean Walker. So he seemed to bring a lot of what Sean Walker brought, just not to the same, um, you know, same degree. Uh, but I thought he looked pretty good. Um, and uh, I was surprised he didn't get more of a look. He's not like that old of a guy. Um, he's one of those guys where, you know, maybe he has a Nick Sealer future ahead of him where he could end up finding his NHL role, you know, as he approaches 30. Yeah, Bel Pedio, um, similar thing for me, uh, giving him a B minus. I couldn't really point out really any issues with his game. Like there wasn't any glaring mistakes whatsoever where he's breaking down and teams were really scoring on him or taking advantage. I thought he was actually one of the more solid defensemen when he did play, yeah. uh, breaking up plays, getting the puck up the ice pretty quickly. I, like I wasn't really aware um, of his puck moving ability, not to say that he was jumping off the page or anything, but most of his passes seemed to be on the tape. Chris passing. He wasn't really turning the puck over with his pass out of his own end. Um, so that, at least for me, that's a big part of the, the B minus. Obviously, it's hard to judge and, you know, only 12 games. So who knows if, you know, the sample size got larger, if he's able to keep it up, right? So sure. I think that's the thing you got to be wary of with these small sample sizes, even with the uh, Ginning and Adderd, um, there's only so much you could tell out of 12 games. Sometimes, sometimes a guy gets called up for 12 games. It's he thinks this is a big opportunity. He's gonna, you know, give it give it his all, balls to the wall type play. Where like if he gets into that 30 40 game range, that's when the dips start to happen. So who knows? But I think at least knowing that you have a guy like that in your AHL squad that you could bring up and he could fill in in a pinch and really not be exposed. I think that's a benefit for the Flyers because. To be honest, he could be a guy that, you know, you might find himself in a number seven role coming up here in the future if needed. Yeah. Um, yeah, well said. Uh all right. So overall grade for the for the defense, uh, I gave them a B uh overall. I thought on the power play lacked considerably, but uh considering I gave their penalty kill an A, and the penalty kill was absolutely exceptional this year. Um, they had one downturn that really knocked them out, but they were in first place on the penalty kill for a large chunk of the year. They finished in the top five. Um, so I gave the defense a B. I thought they did their job well this year. Um, lack some offensive punch, which really is what hurt them. Um, but as far as like overall ability to shut teams down, um, I thought there were times this year that they absolutely excelled um beyond anyone's expectations and uh, again when they were healthy um they looked really good uh but you know with the injuries with the call-ups you know it, you saw a lot of the shortcomings but it, when it when it was that six of you know york sandheim walker sealer um zamula and uh, ristolainen i thought that they were like the best that they uh that they looked. And if it was that defense all year round, we would have been in the playoffs um, and probably been very annoying to play against because of our ability to play defense. And you can see that as the play, I've talked about this all the time. The flyers were playing a, a playoff brand of hockey, at least training to do so. I don't know if they've necessarily hit that point, um, but they were playing that way when other teams were still trying to find that game. Um, and they were able to play that shutdown hockey. And we saw that as they shut down some of the best teams in the league this year. Um, so I think they deserve those grades. What do you think? Yeah. So I would have to agree. Uh, you gave him a B, I gave him a B minus. Um, okay. but I just look at how the flyers were defensively as a whole this season, other than that stretch, um, that kind of knocked them out of the playoffs. There wasn't any extended period where they were getting their doors blown off defensively. Um, usually we're in pretty close games and typically they were out shooting teams and out chancing teams. So that's a really good sign for how you're playing defensively, right? Like they executed their system, not perfectly on a nightly basis, but majority of the time 
they did not spend a ton of time in their defensive zone. They were getting the pucks out quickly, and that's what the system was calling for, right? Transitioning up the ice um, as quick as they could, essentially. So, yeah, just looking at it that way um, and looking at the overall defense, I mean, I gave them a B minus, and you factor in the player grades as well. It kind of um, lends to a to a B minus, but. Um, another aspect too is the penalty kill, right? Like I gave the penalty kill an A. Um, the Flyers had a really, really good penalty kill this season. Um, they had an 83.4 um, penalty killing efficiency rate this season. Uh, and that had them fifth in the league. Um, the only teams ahead of them were the Rangers, 84.5%, the Kings, 84.6%, and the Hurricanes, 86.4%. And those are all, you know, teams that made the playoffs. Um, so it just shows, I think for the flyers, like their penalty kill is right there with some of the best teams in the league. If that power play could just be, you know, middle of the road, they probably find themselves in the playoffs this season. Right. And I think that's something that we kind of all have um, looked at and kind of accepted at this point. And then just another point with the penalty kill, like you have to look at it last season, there were a team uh, that was in the twenties in the 20 range in the penalty kill and moved all the way up to fifth in the league. Like that's huge improvement. So that's a, another reason um, why uh, the, the defense gets a B minus for me. Just that, that improvement overall in the penalty kill is huge for the team defensively as a whole, obviously kudos as well to Brad Shaw, who's running the penalty kill there that, I mean, he had a huge effect on why they're able to step it up, um, to that extent so and I, i'm actually looking here on my notes i have my end of season grades from last year and i gave the penalty kill a d plus the defense a c plus which is honestly probably high for last season uh and i gave you know you look at that in comparison to this year where i gave them a b and an a so definite improvement there from the the flyers defense yeah, exactly. And like, look at last season. Um, the Flyers were, let's see. They were like 23rd. Yeah, 23rd. So just think about the jump, almost like 20 full spots, basically, in the yeah. PK. It's it's uh, pretty insane. And that kind of lends to how um, much they tightened up defensively from the yep. prior seasons, right? Like, they, they weren't letting those backdoor goals in like they were the past two seasons this year. I mean, it was happening in that one stretch that kind of fucked them. But like, other than that, uh, it was pretty few and far between that you were seeing them let those types of goals in. So yeah. All right, let's move on to the goaltending. Uh, we're I'll just state this now: we're not going to do uh, Ivan Fedotov. You know, we talked about it ahead of time, and Vasily brought up a good point that it was just like guys played three games. How the hell, you know? Yeah, you can't judge which, a goalie off three games, man. Right, and one of which he was thrown into the fire. Didn't even have his own equipment, so. Um, no real sense to grade him at this point. We'll we'll focus on that next year. Um, so uh, goaltending wise, start off with uh, the main man Sam Arison. I gave him a B minus. Uh, really high highs this year. Um, like really really high. Uh, obviously, the first half of the year when he was playing a backup role with Carter Hart, he looked like an A. Um, there are times he he was just so good this year, but too many games. Uh, he just didn't bring his a game um, and that's why i gave him a b minus uh just because it's like look your numbers weren't great in the end and you know you had some some clunkers in there um and he struggled he finished strong which was really important and i, I think that played into the b minus grade uh, i still see him as a as a starter in the nhl i thought he had a great rookie year um but just some inconsistency led from it you know where i i thought he probably should have finished with a b um, but overall, if you look at, you know, some of the clunkers in there, like I said, and some of the struggles that he had being elevated into a role, I thought B minus, you know, let's keep it safe just because, you know, you can't give a guy a B with having like pretty mediocre statistics for the year. Um, but I really love Sam, what Sam Harrison did. And it's almost a shame that, you know, his season was kind of you know, rocked from that um, just because he probably should have had a higher grade this year if, you know, wasn't elevated so far. You know, his save percentage was was under 900. So, and his goals against were okay, two, um, 2.82. We weren't bad. Um, but the save percentage was just kind of low. He had too many games where it was just like, ah, he doesn't, he doesn't look like himself. Um, so I had to go with a B minus. 
Uh, for Urson, I gave him a little higher. Um, I gave him a B. Okay. And um, a big reason for me is just the position that he got thrown in. And yeah. as a goalie, mentally, I think he did a really great job adjusting, right? Like, he was never expecting to be the starter. He was never in the mindset that, like, oh, shit, I'm going to be the guy that the Flyers are relying on every single night to backstop them to wins, keep them in games. But that ended up being the case, right? And he adjusted pretty well as a rookie in the NHL. Um, especially to when you consider the fact that he played 51 games, that's the most he's ever played in his career. The second highest he's ever played is 42 for the Phantoms last season and 42 uh, back um, for Brynus in 2020, 2021. So this guy played the most games he's ever played in his career um, and held his own in a lot of them. And then, you know, he had a lot of games where he stole wins for the Flyers, right? Like, Four shutouts in a rookie season is pretty good. Um, and there was a lot of times where he was unbeatable a lot of nights. And then the coin kind of flipped where everything was going by him, especially to end the season too, where the fatigue was really adding up and he was really playing a lot of games in a short period of time. Like I think there was a point in the season where I believe March, um, where you ended up playing like, I think 25 or so games in 30 or 31 nights, which is crazy for a goalie, especially a rookie to get that type of usage. You're not usually expecting it. Um, just to go over the stats. He got a 2.82 goals against average 890 save percentage. Um, not great. Um, the 282 goals against average is pretty solid for a rookie. The 890 save percentage is where you want to see the improvement. Right. Um, but I think a lot of that, like I said, has to do with just the fatigue factor. Like, as you saw, when he got a bit of a break there, um, a couple days in a, of a break and Fedotov got in, you saw when he came back, he looked so much better. And I think just if he would have had um, more of an adequate backup to help him down the stretch, perhaps, um, he would have had better results. But look at the overall record, right? 23, 19, and 7. Um, winning record as a rookie playing 51 games. I, I just think for him right now, the sky's the limit in terms of what the potential might be. Uh, I think he does have the potential to be a starting goalie in the I, league. I have a different record for him. Is, it, is that inconsistent? I have 23, 7, and 17. And for... Uh, wow. I I have oh, 23, weird. 19, and 7 on Hockey weird. TV, so okay. not sure. Weird. Yeah, yeah. This is probably wrong then, I assume. Anyway, uh, sorry, No worries. Ahead. But yeah, so... Um, just the fact that um, you know, he could come in and do what he did under the circumstances. That's why he gets a B for me. I think he was put in a pretty uh, unfair situation. And like I was saying, I think the sky's the limit. Like for him to come in and do this as a rookie, not even expecting it. Now he's gonna have a full offseason to prepare and understand that hey, I'm the starter. I know what it's like to take on a work club that's 51 games. So he's gonna have more insight on how to make sure his body doesn't break down going ahead. So I expect an even better season for him next year, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, all right, next on the list. Uh, it's Carter Hart. Um, so yeah, Hart's next up. Um, for me, he got to be as well. Um, obviously, it's hard to judge him just because of what happened. Um, I think you have to look at it and look at the unavailability factor um, as being important here too, right? Like, obviously, not to his control, like why he got pulled out for what happened. I mean... You know, you're getting charged with what he got charged with. It's serious allegations. But just the fact that he put the Flyers, I guess, in that situation, uh, I think if that never happened, he probably would have got a higher grade for me. <laughs> uh, but it just it, it just is what it is, obviously. Um, he was only able to play 26 games. Um, in that time, he had a 907 um, save percentage and a 280 goals against average. So the goal against average wasn't that great, but he was above that nine range in um, save percentage at, at 907. I think there was points where, you know, Hart looked like a top 10 goalie in the league, bona fide, you know, NHL elite goaltender for me this season. And there were some times where he looked a little bit underwhelming as well. Um, and I think that's why he gets the B, but mainly what it is is just unavailability. The Flyers, I think it's, everybody could say this, if he never got pulled from the team, if he was with the Flyers all season, I think their goaltending situation dramatically is different. You have an Urson that you can rely on a lot more because he's not playing as much games. And 
quite frankly, I think if he's on the team, they probably make the playoffs. Just being yeah. able to have that goaltending tandem, that one-two punch that was super strong, right? Because there was a point where they were alternating game to game and both of them were playing really well. And the Flyers, I think their big one of their biggest strengths halfway through the season before he got pulled was the fact that their goaltending was so strong and was the fact that they could alternate goaltenders and not have a problem um, and, and get consistent goaltending. I think pulling that away from this Flyers team makeup really hurt them, not being able to rotate goalies down the stretch i think probably really uh took them out of the playoff conversation so yeah uh i gave cutter hard uh a b as well um you know he didn't have a perfect season and in, in the time that he did play uh but he didn't have any like absolute clunkers and he had some really great games his struggles actually started coming right before the announcement of him being pulled away from which the team. Which makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, which <laughs> retrospectively, you know, you kind of understand uh, why his, his head wasn't 100% in there. Um, I know people wanted, like, we're saying Arison was better than Hart. I never saw that uh, this year. I thought Hart uh, was the backbone uh, of the team. Um, like, when he was, I, I think he's been, he was immensely valuable to this team. Uh, and I think his numbers would have got stronger as the season went on, not worse. Um, I think he was starting off like average and was getting better and better. And then th all that, you know, the I'm sure he heard the news before we did. Um, and that seemed to affect his numbers. His numbers were fine. Um, then got then he had, then he won goaltender of the week. Um, then they started dipping off uh, after that. So and then the news broke, like, I think, uh, two weeks after. So. Uh, I think his numbers were even better at one point before all that broke out. And I think uh, he would have had a better save percentage and a lower goals against average. And I think what you said about Sam Harrison is absolutely true too, is I think his statistics would have also been better. His numbers really came from his clunkers, three of which were in the very beginning of the year. He gave seven goals at one point. So you got to figure all that affects their statistics. Um, I think there was a trickle down effect on that, but I, I did think that Carter Hart, if he would have played a full season with the Flyer, probably would have had a better grade. And I think uh, they they most likely would have made the playoffs. Um, I think it was a multi factor effort as to why they didn't, but this was definitely one of the biggest um, considerations. Um, especially if you were you were losing defensemen, you were losing, um, you know, you're losing goaltending. Like all that hampers a team that excelled at five on five. Um, excelled on the penalty kill. Uh, those are two humongous elements of that. So, um, yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to the next goalie. Uh, you know, I think about it. We we didn't grade Fedotov at three games. The other two guys were going to grade played five. Um, so not that fair to them too. Um, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, so Cal <laughs> <laughs> Cal Peterson, I gave a D. Um, he had a couple games he had one game in particular where he played really well um and he was just prone to just kind of blowing it uh which seems to be his reputation at the nhl level and he had a few of those at the ahl level as well but he had a really strong ahl end of the season and played really well in the playoffs um i know people were like knocking on him but um he had one really bad game in the playoffs outside of that he played really well um i watched him um he definitely held his own out there and you know was a big part of the team I'm hoping that for his sake, he can have a good AHL season next year, maybe find himself on another team, at least playing an AHL role. Maybe he'll end up being the type of guy who goes overseas uh, after this. But um, I gave him a D just because, you know, I would say 70% of it, he wasn't very good, but then he had like 30% where he was good. Um, so I didn't want to give him like an F because um, I don't think he necessarily deserves that. But he only played five games with the team, but at no point did he instill any confidence uh, in you. Uh, what yeah i agree i mean i gave him a d minus so just a okay. little notch lower than you but i think the main thing is there was a time when peterson was in the net where you were like oh we're safe i think pretty much with peterson it was like every shot you were almost holding your breath that anything could go in and yeah. when you saw that pittsburgh game some of the goals they were scoring and some of the angles that he was letting goals in you were just like oh man right like he just was having trouble making the easiest of saves to give a, the Flyers a win in a game they really needed against the Penguins. That's that yeah. game that really stands out for me. Yep, and think same. about think about now, if you look at retrospectively, if they would have won that game, 
they would have made the playoffs oh, yeah. essentially, right? So you look at it and you think like, hey, if he even can make a fucking save basically in that game, like they probably win that. Like they lose that 7-6 on multiple goals that were bad angles. So when you think of it that way, he just couldn't make a save when they needed it. And that's why he gets the, the D minus. Obviously, the team didn't really have confidence that he could help them because they've called up Felix Sandstrom almost immediately after that. And we're like, hey, anything is better than what we just got from Pete. Peterson. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to look at the stats, I mean, 3.90 goals against average, um, 864 save percentage. So it speaks for himself as to why the D minus occurred really um, just wasn't reliable in there at all. Um, so yeah, that's why he gets a D minus for me did play good, you know, down the stretch for the phantoms. You have to acknowledge that, but we're, we're grading his play with the flyers here. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really factor in, uh, but I kudos to him there. Like, you know, I wasn't sure how he would play for them in the playoffs. And there wasn't many games where you were like, oh, no, like he can't save a beach ball type thing. Like he played fairly well. So, um, uh, yeah, that's that's why Peterson gets the D minus um, for me. And then Sandstrom, I gave a D. And let's be honest, like he wasn't much better than Peterson, right? Like there were certain games where I think, you know, you had more confidence that he would make the saves, but he was just as prone to giving up weak goals at bad times. Um, and, and his five games, technically his record was worse, right? Peterson was two and two. He was a one and two. Um, his save percentage was 823 in the five games. The goals against was um, 387 for Sandstrom. I just think he got it a little bit of a notch higher because Um, some of the goals he gave him up weren't as bad necessarily. Like I think some of the goals Peterson gave up were just flat out like awful. Like if you were just on your angle, you would have made the save. Like I wasn't sure what he was really doing. He's swimming in the net a lot. Peterson had a little bit more, uh, or no, Sandstrom had a little bit more stability in terms of the positioning, but I mean, the results weren't much better, right? Like they were both not very good. They were both disappointing. It was both in a sense where, Hey, if they win, you know, those two games that they lose on the record, the Flyers are in the playoffs. So you got to look at it that way that the goaltending in a sense, both of them kind of, kind of failed, um, you know, giving any stability really to, to a Flyers team that needed it in the backup position there. Yeah. I don't really have anything too much to add uh, to that. Yeah. Felix stands from a D for me. Um, it disappointing because I thought he actually, I completely agree with what you said. I think he was more stable in net than Peterson, but he and Tortorella said it perfectly. He failed to come up with a big save majority of the time when we needed it. He had it. Um, he had a couple games where he did, um, but overall, it was you know, it was a lot more to be desired there. Um, and uh, you know, I do kind of blame some of his stats on the way the team played at times. Uh, but I, you know, I thought he could have played a lot better, and uh, you know. I think everybody assumes it's the end of the road for Felix here in Philadelphia. Maybe he'll find a home somewhere else um, in the NHL, but realistically I could see him going back over to, to Sweden. I think that's um, the likeliest. Yeah. It hasn't been announced scenario. yet, but I, I do think that that's very likely, especially with Kolosov being here and uh, you know, Peterson's still here and uh, not a lot of room, signing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And not a lot of opportunity for him to, to play pro. And he also, completely lost his spot in the playoffs to uh to Kolosov as well so i think the organization already has uh you know kind of seen him though it's interesting because i i'm surprised that sandstrom didn't beat out peterson for that role just because i think sandstrom is the better goalie of the two um at least i think it might just factor into the that he's not going to be around yeah like peterson has the one year they know he's going to be with the phantoms next season might as well play him yeah, um, and there's a situation. The difference, like, negligible. Uh, so, overall, I gave goaltending a C. Um, I thought it started, like, if if Arison and Hart would have been here all year, like, it would have probably been a lot higher. Uh, you know, at Probably least a, a B, B or a B plus a B, even overall. Yeah, depending on how it finished. But, you know, we never got to see that. Um, and the performances from the people who did step in, and you can include Fedotov in that outside of the one performance – Nobody fit the bill, so everything was put on Sam Arison. So I didn't, couldn't even give it a B minus to where Arison's game was because, you know, the other team, <laughs> the other goalies didn't do well. Uh, so I kept it at a C. Um, statistically, it was bad, um, and uh, the only reason it's not a lower grade uh, is because of Sam Arison and the time that Carter Hart did play here. So in the beginning of the season, it would have been a lot higher. 
Um, second half of the year, it was a burden on this team uh, in a lot of ways. So C is the highest I can give it. Yeah, if I would have graded the goaltending at the end of January, where it's both Hart and Urson both having success, both alternating, both playing well, I probably would have given it like a BB plus. Yeah, and then who knows if they would have made the playoffs and how they would have played, what we would have ended up giving them. But I think it would have probably been higher than what my grade is, which is a C. So I give the goaltending a C on the same page, and really it only gets a C because Urson kind of um, held up the other goalies based on his play. Like if you take Urson away and you're just creating like Sandstrom. Peterson and Fedotov, you're probably getting a D in goaltending. Um, and also, like, look at the stats overall. Even Urson's stats weren't good. Like, Hart had the best stats of any of the goalies. Mm -hmm. um, so that factors into the C as well. Um, really, what it ends up being, like you said, right, nobody was able to step up and support Urson and really help him. And I think that was the reason why his even play dwindled and the goaltending gets to see in general. Like, if you even have one of those guys step up and give some adequate gains as a backup – uh, Urson probably plays a lot better because he gets a lot more rest. And then the overall goaltending is probably like a B minus or something along those lines. Uh, maybe not a C, but I just think nobody stepped up um, and they had opportunities to do so. And then also the stats just were not good, um, even Urson's. And then really what makes it a C and not even lower is just the fact that Urson was able to play well, was able to jump into that role and get 51 games in as right. a rookie and not completely right. crumble, right? Because how many goals have we seen come in as a rookie get too much of a load placed on them and they never bounce back. Where, whereas we saw Urson struggle really mightily, but then the last three, four games, he bounced back, got a shutout, played really well, actually, to end the season off, despite the Flyers not uh, making the playoffs there. So, yeah. yeah, C for me for the goaltending, but I think, um, you know, who knows how Fedotov is going to play next season. And, and same with uh, Urson. I think it could potentially be higher next year. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, that's the end of the grades. Just want to remind everybody, please like and subscribe. If you were listening to this and you have not subscribed, please do so at this point. Um, again, it's just tremendous help to us. So follow us on iTunes, on Spotify as well. Uh, give us a thumbs up on this video if you can. Uh, greatly appreciated. All right, let's talk a little bit about free agency. Um, we want to talk about this last week, but I kind of cut it out. So um, the the big piece of news really to talk about um, is uh, Martin ne Nekish, Nekas, Nekas, Natchez, Natchez, something I don't know exactly like that. It. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> Natchez. Um, so he is apparently not going to be re-signing with the Canes. He is an RFA, um, but apparently demanding too much. I did see people like, oh, trade Konechny for him. I think you guys are out of your goddamn mind. Um, though I, he is a very intriguing young player. Uh, I think he used talented. to be a center. So. Yeah. You know, there are rumors going on that the Flyers would be interested. I do think this is the type of investment you would want to make in this guy. Um, but you know, you're not trading Travis Konechny for this guy and making him a center here. Um, I, I, I can't see that happening. Uh, but I do think that, you know, potentially moving a player, um, and again, I'm not saying they're going to do this or they should do this, but like, you know, you move a frost and a, maybe a combination of frost or something for net net nature, um, could be intriguing. Um, probably not enough. You know, I don't know what they want for him. I'm not a big fan of trading for RFAs. Uh, I am definitely not a fan of offer sheets. I think majority of the time they're really stupid actually and people like keep begging for them and there's a reason they don't happen and it has nothing to do with pissing off the other team it's dumb on the surface level you're giving up way too much yes yeah, yeah. so not only are you overpaying salary for that player but you're also giving away assets in compensation for the rfa steal uh yeah. it is not a smart move and that's why teams don't do it it is rarely worked out for teams that have done it um, it can work out. It's not like a horrendous uh, idea in, in all situations or anything like that. But yeah. majority of them, not wise. Well, I think, sorry, Reef, for the offer no, go ahead. I think it's like, if it's an elite player, maybe it makes sense to overpay because you know they're elite. Is Nature's sure. elite? No. Is he really good? Yeah. So I don't think it's worth it. Like, think about, you know, Shea Weber, that offer sheet, right? That he signed to come with the Flyers. Like, he was elite. That might have been worth it. Natchez, I don't know if you're going to overpay him, if it'll be worth it. But it's an interesting proposition. Like, um, 
So his career high was 2022-23. He had 71 points in 82 games. Um, fell back a bit this season, a bit of an underwhelming year coming off his career high of 71 points. He only had 53 points this season um, uh, in 77 games, but he did have nine points in 11 games in the playoffs, so really stepped it up there. Um, so it's not surprising to me that the Canes are not going to sign him. I mean, they're typically sticklers with money in a sense, and he's asking for a bit much, so... It's not surprising that they're going to try to trade him and recoup his value. And they have Jake Gensel to try to sign. So I'd imagine they're going to want to keep Gensel over what him you, as what do you winger. Th what do you think? I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have cut you off at that point. But I, you know, what do you think about the Joel Farabee concept of trading a guy like Farabee for Natchez? Um, I mean, Natchez is 25. Farabee's what, 24 or turning yeah. 24? Yeah. Um, both technically wingers. I mean, to be honest, from a production standpoint, if I was going to trade Faraby straight up for Natchez, if that's what the trade is, I'd have to say yes. I mean, Natchez has gone seven, 71 points in his career, um, 53 this year, more than Faraby. Like, you could say that Faraby has more room to grow, but Natchez is only a year older. So, I mean, realistically, it's very similar. So, if you are going to make a trade and you are going to trade Faraby, this would be kind of the trade that you're looking that's at, one, right? That's one that I could see Carolina accepting you know yeah um but you'd have to over you i mean the, the kid is demanding I, I assume somewhere around seven million a that's year that's the thing you're paying him more than you would be paying Faraby for right. almost similar production so if you're the flyers you're betting on natchez you know getting back to like 71 75 points a season whereas Faraby might get there um uh, but natchez has to get back there so who knows but i think it would be a fair trade like i, I look at the trade and i'm like Hey, if it's straight up, it's pretty fair in a yeah. sense. Um, because you're getting Farabee's the younger player by a year, has more room to grow and more, is locked up. Yeah, at a cheaper rate. So yeah. So look, on that level, I'm more intrigued to to remove one of the leaders of the team who, you know, outperformed Natchez is a year older. Um, I don't know. I I'm not really running to do that. I can understand why people say it. You know, yeah. TK is up for a contract, but then again, like one Carolina is not going to want to play TK either. What he's asking, ten million, so, yeah. right? So they're not investing in a guy they're going to be keeping. Um, I do think I don't think TK is getting ten million a year. Uh, the guy's never hit a point per game pace. So it's going to be very hard for him to make that case. Um, I think he'll probably get something close to what Rupe Hints got, probably like near nine, like a high high eights, somewhere around there, maybe nine million uh per year over a over long term. Um yeah. but I am intrigued by the player. I mean I, I would like the player. Uh the player himself I you know if I'm somehow, definitely interested. If somehow you could make the guarantee that he could come here and be a successful center, then I think it made makes the trade more attractive. But then you wonder if he could be a center, why was Carolina using him as a winger his whole career? Probably because he can't be a center at the NHL level. Right. He's probably a winger, right? So like just the chance that you're going to come here and then John Tortorella is going to turn him to a center. Like, I mean, he's a great coach, but so was Rod Brindamore and he wasn't a center under Brindamore. So like chances are like that idea that, oh, well maybe they could use him as a center. Like I, I fucking don't see that happening. Well, maybe like, Maybe the thought is that they don't have as much like competition there. Maybe, uh, you know. But like, if it if they are like, I I still believe in Frost's ability, and I don't think Frost will get you Natchez like you know in a straight up trade. No, I don't. You know, maybe maybe if it's Frost and the second first round pick that you have this year, then um, you can get him. Yeah, yeah. Then I think that you're you're probably in that territory of getting him over here. Um, and maybe that's something to investigate, but, but again, then you're if, subtracting from your weak center depth that you right, already need to you add need to, to. So yeah, then you need to be sure this guy's going to be playing center. Um, again, maybe he still has that ceiling of being a 70 point player. Um, but I, again, I, I always put up these stat things with like, recognize that the team he played for is better. He had 28 goals, 43 assists. I'm not knocking it, but again, you're playing on a, on a higher higher end offense than what the flyers think have. about that power play too how many power right. play points are in the equation there and the flyers exactly. power play stinks like yeah so yeah. it's it's not that it's inflated you know but like would he put up that production here um or would it be closer to the 53 points that he put up 
you know, again, he's young. Yeah. He's young, so he's still got room to grow. Like, I'm not going to, you know, knock the players not being valuable. I'm just, I notice a lot of people are, like, always trying to overpay for grass is greener. You know, like, and I might be in the minority in this, but, like, the Mitch Marner thing, too, that also falls in my mind. I'm like, is Mitch Marner a 100-point player on the Flyers the way they are constructed today? I'm not convinced of that. I, yeah. I just like I didn't think Johnny Goudreau was a hundred point player on Columbus. Well, my thing is like, let's say you traded him and Frost. Let's say you traded Frost in a first, for example, like your proposal, um, you know, for an HS, and then you get him and you got to pay him seven and a half million or something. And then he only ends up being a 55 point player. You kind of screwed yourself. Right. And mm -hmm. you kind of almost overpaid and gave away a guy in frost that could put up similar numbers for like considerably less. Like he's making 2 million or something next year, like yeah. even less than that. So like, I think it's one you'd have to be careful with. And I think if you're going to trade for him, it shouldn't be from the center position. It'll have to be from the wing because yeah. you can't be convinced that he's a center because he's never done it at the NHL level before. So. Right. And, and look like Kakani Emmy is a team that, Carolina invested in and they're you know as an RFA status with look how that get, turned out right it's like I I don't like these type of moves they're they just don't seem like guarantees it it doesn't seem like the Flyers are really in a great position to get him it seems like more of a team that might be in a similar position with one of their players who you know they're not sure if they want to keep him but he has value or maybe they need it maybe they are going to move a defenseman you know, to get him or something like that. Like, I, I don't know. I don't think the Flyers are necessarily set up the best for that, but this is exactly the type of player you would want to invest in in the Flyers position. So, like, I do understand why the Flyers would be interested. I understand why fans are interested. I'm not interested in moving TK for him, um, but I would be interested in moving value for him. Like, if they traded Faraby for him, and I'm high on Faraby, I would not be like, oh, bummed out. I'd be like, okay, cool. We got another high-end player um, wh who has high-end upside, playmaking upside, right? Like, there is significant value, and his age aligns with what we need. So uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's something we need to keep an eye on. I just I don't want to overpay because people want the shiny thing over on another team. You know, and I like what you said, uh, Vasily. If they are a proven star, that is a whole different conversation than a player who's had one great year, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it could be an outlier, right? Like, right. He, he might get back to that. It might not be that. But statistically, there's no concrete evidence point to that yet, right? So you, you don't want to even part with those assets. Like, for example, if you could, you know, put Faraby in a package or put Frost in a package and get a bona fide first line player that would be more attractive than going after a guy that right. like of nature's is ilk. So why, you know, you might as well save your assets for somebody who's a guarantee versus somebody that is a maybe, because I think fair and frost are already your maybes. Like well, you're only training for another maybe versus a guarantee in yeah. a sense. Yeah. And he had a strong, uh, world championship tournament too. We should credit. Yeah. Him Czech Republic too. won that tournament. Yeah. Um, and he had and seven points in five games, one, one goal, six assists again, playing a playmaking role. We need that type of player here. Exactly. So uh, there is value to trying to bring this guy over. I just don't know what kind of package we would offer. Faraby, uh, Faraby and Frost are really the only two guys I can think of. Uh, maybe a Bobby Brink would be included in something like that. Maybe trying to a, save uh, money potentially. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's a Brink Frost combination that could get you Natchez where they're kind of up against the wall and they're trying to you know get rid of this guy. So you try to you know because again the idea of trades and I feel like people don't fully go by this is like is to win a trade you know you don't like if it's fair value great but like you want to win trades that is in the back of your mind what you're hoping for is that you walk away with the win like most teams that trade a high-end player right like if we were to trade oh, Carter Hart, you're losing if you're if you're trading the best player in the deal you're losing that trade you just hope that you have enough subsequential assets you know, like if you look at the um, Calgary trade of Brady to Chuck, or not Brady, I'm sorry, Matthews to Chuck for uh, Hudobin, Huberto. Uh, Huberto, thank you, Hudobin, uh, Huberto and uh, Mackenzie Weaver. You know, Mackenzie Weaver had a great year this year, right? But they still lost that trade. Um, they, now, on surface level, it looked like it was even, 
but they still lost the trade because the best player in the deal is now with Florida. It's who's Kachuk, yeah. Yeah. So And obviously, like, if you look at Uyghur and you look at Huberto, they just didn't fit into Calgary's team yeah, makeup like, like they did in Florida. So, Like, let's say, theoretically, we trade Joel Farabee and Bobby Brink for Natchez, right? And, which I think a lot of people will be like, yeah, like, go for it. Well, what happens if Joel Ferry put, puts up 60 points next year and and Natchez puts up 60 points here and then we lost Bobby Brink for like a horizontal trade? It's just like... It's not a bad know. trade, but it's not worth it. Right. Did we win that trade? No, we kind of like broke even or maybe even a little bit lost because we lost Bobby Brink. But... It's like, I'm not rushing to make those trades. That's, that's my point. It's not the end of the world. It wouldn't be like cry because we still have a good value, but it's, it's like I'd rather like walk away like... Like I think about the um the Richards Carter trades, you know, like yeah, we lost as far as the best player w- initially was that, but if you look at what the Flyers really got for Richards, you know, we got Wayne Simmons, Braden Shen, like the value was one hundred percent there, and you look at the uh the what uh the Jeff Carter one, that's like an easy like uh, come on, Jake win, Voracek yeah. and Sean Couturier. Those are the type of trades and that the I, fact I'm Columbus trying to traded make. him like fucking three months yeah. later. Yeah, too, that was, so. a, was such a stupid trade on their part. But um, yeah, for Natchez too, I think one last point is yeah. you got to look at the leverage. Like everybody's thinking it's going to take some big package to get him. Like Carolina's right. kind of backed up against the wall because they don't want to sign him, and other teams know they don't want to pay him and sign him. So they're going to try to get him like pennies on the dollar. So maybe. It'll maybe there maybe it's not going to cost as much as you think to get him, which will make it interesting. And I think that will potentially get more teams in involved. So I I don't know. I, I wouldn't expect the Flyers to grab him personally. I think it's going to end up being like a swap with another team that was also in the playoffs that might have a similar type of player, and they end up swapping or something. Like yeah, that. I think I think what we're probably looking at is like an RFA got a swap potentially. Yeah. For sure. You know, uh, I don't know why my list of RFAs is not working here, but there are players out there that are in RFA status where, you know, you can swap the RFA, um, you yeah. know, player who's, you know, they're all going to be in that similar age root range. Uh, maybe it'll be an RFA plus a pick or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, like I wouldn't want to move them for Owen Tippett, and that's probably what they would ask for. Right. Which makes sense. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the skills at the points, it's very right. similar, right? Like, but I, I wouldn't jump to that because I'd rather have Owen Tippett with you'd the You'd rather have the guy that he... can score more goals than right. is the playmaker, essentially. Exactly. Though, again, I don't, I hate like knocking Natchez because he seems to be a high value. Um, you know, maybe somebody like, I wonder if Carolina would be interested in like Sean Dursey from like Utah. Or slash Arizona, it's I mean possible. he he's an RFA. He had forty one points in seventy six games this year. He's arguably their You'll, best defense. You know what? I could see it because I think Pe- Pesh, I believe Pesci and Brady Shea um, are free agents or set to be free agents for the Canes or something like that. That's so. probably why they don't want to pay Natchez. They probably want to keep their defense together, which makes know? a lot of sense because that's the strength of their team. Um, just to touch, like we didn't have some of the topic list, but just connect me and like the whole 10 million. Um, Anthony DeMarco had an article up this morning or today, um, uh, kind of just going into detail on what he thinks. So I just wanted to bring it up. Sure. Um, he was saying that one person told him that, um, uh, connect his agent in him. So I believe, uh, his agent is, uh, let me see here. I believe his agent is Pat Morris. Yeah, so Pat Morris of Newport Sports. He's one of the like heavy hitters, one of the big agents in the league. Apparently, him and Konechny are looking for up to ten million over an eight year term, which is what we've uh, have heard. I mean, based on his production being kind of the best player on the team offensively, and the fact the cap's going up, I'm really not surprised that he's asking for ten million right off the bat. Um, apparently, off of Demarco's understanding, the Flyers' comfort zone is eight million to eight point five million. Yeah, it's a, um, it's like pretty one com- thought. Yeah, one comparable that was mentioned is Timo Meyer. Uh, who signed an eight-year deal uh, with the Devils and his AAV is 8.8 million, Mm -hmm. which actually would be a pretty good comparable. I think um, if you look at Konechny and just what he's brought to the table, I don't think he can command $10 million. I mean, you look at 
the other players in the league making $10 million. Typically, those are point-of-game guys. He's been close to being a point-of-game. He's yet to really do it. So the Flyers are obviously going to bring that up um, and use that to their advantage in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Though over the last five seasons, Konechny does have 276 points in 331 games. So he's close to point-of-game, but he's still not quite there. I ultimately think it'll be a deal. Like I think the Flyers will sign Konechny. Um, I think it would be hard for them to trade him. He's their best player. I guess you have to look at the wingers and say, Hey, like you have a ton of wingers. Maybe you trade him and try to, you know, shore up the D shore up the centerman, which I mean, in the right trade, sure. Anybody's tradable, but it's going to be hard to parlay connecting into that center, into that defenseman because teams ultimately don't value wingers as much as center or defenseman. Right. So why are they going to want to trade their top center, top defenseman for a guy who's on the wing if they're going to have to re-sign for millions of dollars? Like, I just, I think it's a hard situation um, to kind of parlay him into something like that. Ultimately, I look at... Um, one of Jamie's tweets, he said, it's negotiations. He set a price. That's always why they negotiate. Right. The ask will always be higher. And we do it as people all the times in our daily lives, right? Like think about you going to your boss for a raise. You're always going to ask for more than probably they might give you. And then you settle in the middle. So I think that connecting asks for 10, the flyers probably go to 8.5 and they're like, no. And then they end up somewhere around the nine range, which makes yeah. a lot of sense with the cap going up here. And, and, I don't think that that's an insulting number. I mean, over eight years, you figure it is $8 million. But think um, about the cap going up 4 million. Yeah. And then really like 10 million is almost like you're paying 8 million. Like you have to factor it in that right. way. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't look that way on the surface level. Cause there's got the upper echelon guys like Panarin, like, you know, uh, things like that are making 10 million, like, you know, McDavid's Marner's Matthews, 11, 12 million. So you're too close to that. We have to think about from like five, six years down the line, every player that's close to a point of game now is going to start making about nine, 10 million. That's just yeah. what it's going to be with the, yeah. with the cap going up. So, yeah. And I th look, I think connect will get somewhere around 9 million a year from the flyers. And I think that's a fair contract. And I think he'll probably accept something. It could be slightly above nine even, um, but it'll be something about, I, I would hope that they can get him. I mean, not for his sake, more for just for cap management, that you can get him slightly under nine. Um, again, Rupe hints has similar production, uh, similar caliber of player. Uh, he's making just under uh, nine million. And again, like you can front load the contract and give him a large sum of money. Yeah, now, right. Or you can bonuses, give him twelve million. Well, you can give him twelve. Signing. Yeah, but you can give him like twelve million in actual cash value. But yeah. over the long run of your contract, you'll get you know a, a nine right. million dollar cap hit. And then if you need to trade him later, it's more attractive for other teams. Exactly. Because it's not as much salary. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I expect them to sign him. My only thing will be, do they sign him this off season? Or do they sign him, um, you know, next season at some point throughout the season? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think they get it done this off season? I or? think they do because I think Konechny realizes his position within the organization. Like theoretically, let's say Mitch Cobb comes over here, right. And rips it up and he has a down year. Then he becomes expendable almost right. A little more expendable. Like if he doesn't, I, again, I still, I would expect him to have at very least the same type of year he had this year. Potentially, I guess he could bet on himself and be like, I can do even better. And if, and if he does better then he's worth 10, you yeah, know, agreed. and the flyers would be like, fine. You, you know, bet on they, yourself and look what you did, right? And look so. what you did. So you're worth it to us because not only did you do what you did last year, but you did you did better. You you deserve that extra. And the money. pressure was on. To, right. To exactly. It, so. so I think that argument can be made. And I think that the Flyers probably wouldn't even be upset if that's the scenario. But I think both sides are gonna he wants to be here. The Flyers want him here. I think they're both gonna be incentivized to get it done. And Agreed. I think if if you're really talking about a million dollar difference, that you're there. You know, like the Flyers are not saying, oh, he's worth seven to us and he wants 10. Right. Yeah. That's what's going on with Natchez. Right. Where to them, they're like, we want to give him six million a year and he probably wants eight. And they're right? like, no. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably wants a full, you eight know, years. seven, eight yeah. year deal. And they probably want to give him a five to six year deal. That's yeah. what I would assume. Where the Flyers are really not playing in that territory. They're like, yeah, we think you're pretty close to what you're asking for. We're just trying to get your number down. And I think they can find a happy medium and um, and get something done. And um, I think it's always you never want to overvalue anybody unless they're the best player in their position or at least like top five in their position. TK really can't say that, even though I love him. 
Um, he's not like the best player in the league at right wing, right? No. He's not in the top five even. Right not now. even in the top 10. So. Right. Now, maybe he can be. Um, I still think that he has a higher ceiling than what he's done. Um, but you're still going to be a multimillionaire by the end of this deal. So if you know yeah. if you want to sign now, you're going to have to go off of what you've done so far. I don't think, you know, Konechny is going to want to... It's also why we saw that signing with Tippett, right? Is that like he got injured and then contract was signed, you know? And maybe that's just coincidence or maybe it's the fact that it's like, hey, I hit a peak here. I'm doing spin around my goals. I'm out there shooting every night. The team thinks really highly of me. Let's just get a deal done. Because, you know, maybe I could have got six and a half to seven or maybe I could have got seven million a year. But, you know, what are we even talking about here? I'm I'm about to be a multimillionaire. I'm about to get a bunch of cash handed to me. And like Konechny, again, if he if he signs the type of deal that he's capable, Rupe Hints is getting eleven million next year, right? On the cat uh in actual cash value. You're multimillionaire like that year, right? So like you're you're and again, they're already making millions, but you know, you're already getting a, a large sum of money the first year of that contract and you're set for life. So why 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 even really risk it unless you truly believe you are a better player than what you've already done, which is possible with TK. So, you know, he could bet on himself. I just don't see it. I see the deal getting done. Um, and if you look at, like, the conversations of Mitch Marner going around the league, I, like, if if Travis Konechny was 6'2", and he played the way he did, he would be one of the highest value players in the league um, because of his attitude, the way he plays and what he brings. But because he's not, you're not Brady to Chuck. You might have the attitude of Brady to Chuck, but you're smaller, right? Yeah, you exactly. can't be as physically imposing. So, that, you know, it's always going to dock you a little bit. Um, Agreed. I yeah. think, too, one thing is, like, there's been reports that he wants to retire a flyer. I think that always plays a factor. Like, you could tell that he, you know, bleeds orange and black, loves the area. So mm -hmm. I think that always plays an effect. It's You got to think about these guys' lives. Okay, I know we only think about them as hockey players, but, you know, their personal lives are a factor. Obviously, the guy um, lives here during the season, probably, you know, owns property of some sort, I would imagine, or something like that, being here for so long. Like, two children. it's tough to, it's, yeah, it's tough to move, right? Like, nobody wants yeah. to move across the country or to a new place so I'm, I'm sure that factors in i'm sure it also factors in that like his best friend in sandheim's on the team and has a long-term deal yeah. as well they probably want to stick together uh, but yeah I, I would be surprised to um see connecting not be resigned here i do wonder if he gets the max eight years like if i'm the flyers if i can get him in at six years i think that's the be a benefit for the flyers but will connect me take that who knows i don't know i don't know but i suspect he will um the other thing I wanted to talk about real briefly is Tampa Bay traded for Ryan McDonough. Um, yeah, weird trade. Which, like, again, good player. Um, used and, to be on Tampa when yeah, they won you, their two cups. So. Right. And, like, I get from one angle, but he's 34 years old, carrying a $6.7 million cap hit. And you look at what's going on with Steven Stamkos, who do a contract, and... Uh, yeah, I'm not weird. sure exactly how much they would have at this point. I'm like trying to. The Preds ate nothing too on the like money wise in that deal. They didn't, they didn't right. retain anything. But what I will caveat is maybe like, so look at this, right? They won two cups um, with McDonough on the back end. Then they lost to Colorado in the final. Um, that offseason after they lost to Colorado in the final in 2022, they immediately trade McDonough. And haven't gone out of the first round since they've, uh, yeah. you know, since uh, he's left. So maybe they're thinking like, hey, like he was a, so crucial to our defense. We need him back. Let's get him back. Apparently, um, Barry trusted him a solid. He said he wanted, like McDonough asked to get traded. He wanted to go back to Tampa specifically. I think his family still lived there. Um, so I think just helping him out family wise. Um, and apparently, according to Trotz, he's one of the best, you know, leaders and locker room leaders he's ever seen. And Trotz has been around a lot of really great teams. Yeah. So I mean, I, maybe I maybe Tampa, all that. yeah, maybe Tampa really thought that hey, we really missed him, and that's why we were, you know, unable to get over the hump in the first round. We really needed defensive presence like his. But I do get your point. Like he's getting older and older, so if, the chances fact, are he's going to get worse down the line and better, right? Well, that honestly, we could have used a guy like McDonough. Um, but wow. I just look at the Steven Stamco situation. I'm like, are you signing him? Where's the money coming from to sign him? Because yeah. you have five million in projected cap space. 
Um, you have one RFA. You have a bunch of UFAs, which I assume they'll let all those guys walk. Yeah. Um, but they'd have to clear cap space. I know Tanner Janot might be out there for them to move, but still, that's two and a half million. He traded so much for him, though. Remember the picks they traded for him? Like, right. It's only like six, it's like six or seven or eight draft picks for one guy. Like, imagine yeah. to turn around and trade him for anything less than that. That'd be terrible. So, yeah. Well, I just think, I think Steven Stamkos might be testing free agency. Yeah, um, unless he's taking a, some huge, unless he's taking some huge discount, so Tampa can get the band back together here with McDonough to go for one last Look, run. Like who knows? But I feel like he's probably not doing that. Like he's probably going to try to get. Well, this will, a, might be his last contract. He's going to want to cash in on that. Well, that's so. the thing. He had eighty points this year. He's only going to get five million. 40, 40, yeah. yeah, forty goals. Interesting. Uh, like some team out there, they're not going to give him a long term deal, but I could see a team giving him a two three year deal at eight million plus. You know, I'm and, just thinking, like, look at uh, Colorado. If they let Nachushkin go and Landeskog's on um, IR there, I think Colorado's a prime spot for Stamkos. In my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few teams that would be open, you know, that if they have... Who wouldn't want him? And like, what's, his, what's his name? is going to be on a, a LTIR for a while, too. Uh, yeah, Landeskog, you just mentioned it. Like, you know, there's just fit. there's other teams that are cup competitor contenders that could fit him. And I just, I assumed that that money that went to McDonough would go to, to your captain. I just don't, I don't really, it's a weird move unless they're planning to trade somebody else, uh, that we're not unaware of who knows. Right. Um, let's see anybody, uh, Sarnik makes 5 million a year. Maybe if you brought McDonough in, maybe they move somebody off the defense. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's I mean, the thought process. I'm not too it's sure. A, it's a, yeah, I, it's just weird because Sergachev's making eight and a half, and they're not going to move him. I no. doubt it. Yeah. Um, you're not moving they're, Hedman. They're so. not. Gonna, they're not going to move Nick Paul. They're not going to move Anthony Sorelli. Uh, I guess you could try. You could move Sorelli. You could move a 26. lot of guys on that team, but like, does it make sense to move Sorelli to sign a 34 year old Stamkos and bring right. in a 34 year old McDonough? Like it just roster building. I mean, Con Connor Sheary, they sense. can move, but he makes two million a year, and he's thirty one. I'm interested now that you're bringing this up. Like, I'm kind of real interested to see what Tampa does here, right? Because it doesn't it's make a, a lot of a sense. Weird move. It was on a the move surface level, and it's like okay. You know, like you really couldn't afford to add a yeah. $6 million dollar defenseman. And the only way, did. the only way I understand it is kind of how I brought up the first place. The last time they got to the cup was when McDonough was on the decor. So maybe right. they're like, but hey, Sam this Cruz guy is also their captain. Exactly. So unless they, unless they know something we don't, that Steven Sam was signing for four million because they want to win the cup again or something. Like, if who knows? If right? they do that, they look like geniuses. Yeah, they do. You but know? maybe, like, like I said, right? Like the guy's been with the organization his whole career. Maybe he's willing to take a discount like that. Who knows? Maybe maybe they'll give him a freaking six-year deal. Yeah, it's possible. And be, and like, be like, just like, sign here till you're 40. We'll give you $4 million a year for six years. And he's probably you know, like, if sure. you're on LTIR for the last two years, like we don't even care. Like you earned At it. that point, yeah. I think they'll be out of that contention range anyway. So it's more just like, let's try to do what we can now while we're still you know, have the talent, but it's yeah, and interesting. At, and that point I totally get uh, if, if Stamkos was signed and this was like all of their cap remaining, yeah, I would get McDonough, it more. I'd yeah. be like, okay, yeah, they're going all in, you know? Um, but I don't know. It's just weird. And Victor Hedman's going to be due a contract next year and he's 33 and that guy, hey, even he's going to be do a contract. If I'm the flyers, that's I'm looking at Hedman. I'm sure every team is, but I mean, I would give that guy a 34 year old. I'd give him probably like at almost, least eight million dollars a almost year, almost ten million to be honest with you. Like, yeah, he that's going to be a weird contract because he's it's the be impact he can have. Old, man. but he's so good that it's like it's that's almost a like a pronger type deal. Like he's yeah. still at that age making right upper echelon money because he was still so good, right? So. I would have taken McDonough at 34 years old at six six point seven million. I would have been interested in that trade. Yeah. McDonough for Ristolainen or something, you know, and or whatever. I don't even know. That um, would have been interesting. Yeah. Who knows? But, I think that'd be an upgrade for the Flyers perspective. McDonough, yeah. I mean, yeah. But you get winner. the you know, guys thirty four. Th four or five years older. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a weird one. They all the free agency is gonna be weird this year. Um, 
All right, our next topic, and then we'll we'll end on a little bit of playoff talk. It's just prospect wise, London absolutely crushing it. They've gone unbeaten so far in the Memorial Cup. They won their last game five four, um, and uh, they won their other game. I think they was complete shutout four nothing, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. Um, Oliver Bonk, uh, how good is this guy? Um, it's looking really good to me. <laughs> like what? What a draft pick in a late first round pick like i have no idea what to expect from him at this point like as far as offense and people production. were down on that pick initially right everybody's like oh should have went with gay perot and perot's looking like he's gonna be a really good pick as well in that range but mm -hmm. i just think nobody was expecting this offensive production from bonk like you knew the defensive um play was there but the offense is a surprise and yeah. he seems to be getting better offensively as time is going on so that kind of bodes well for what's next in his development at least for yeah me. So Bonk and Barky still looking like really good picks for the Flyers. Again, I don't expect either to be with the Flyers next year. The only one I could suspect will get any kind of real look at NHL position will be Bonk, but I don't think so. I think they're going to send him back um, for one more year uh, so they can have the luxury of playing him in the AHL to start his career. But you never know. I mean, these guys are... They're they're blow they're blowing teams out of the water like they are the favorites to win the Memorial Cup right now like they're yeah. going through the standings so I think they play three games for the standings and then they do the actual tournament element um which is an elimination game I assume I don't remember yeah elimination yeah yeah elimination so there's a good chance they can win the Memorial Cup this year um they are a powerhouse um but Bonk is like. I mean, Barky too is having obviously a tremendous impact on that team, but Bonk is like leading the team uh, in a lot of ways, especially like being a defender. Obviously, Dickinson is also very good, um, but it's like Dickinson and Bonk are like, you know, neck and neck in the impact that they're having on their team. And we're talking about Dickinson going in the top 10 this year. So Bonk just seems like a really, I mean, he's a year older too, but he seems just like a guy who's really panning out. Um, and uh, could end up being a huge impact on the Flyers if he continues this type of growth and trajectory and offensive, uh, you know, swing up because he's turning into a goal scoring defenseman, and uh, that's awesome to see. Uh, okay, and let's talk about playoffs here. So, as we're recording right now, the game is just kicking off, uh, between Edmonton and Dallas. That is game four. Uh, right now, the Stars are actually up one Uh My pick for this series was the Stars. Um, I think Oilers getting that initial win. I think, look, I, I, I think the Oilers are better than I anticipated, um, but I don't expect them to win this series. I honestly could even see Dallas closing it out in five. Um, and I also heard something interesting on the SDPN podcast that Dallas has, has yet to win a first game in a series. They pretty much they, they they haven't won the first game in a series for like a few years, yeah. um. So they they tend to lose the first game, but I just think because of their, I still stand by the fact that depth wins championships, and if you want your best player to show, he's got to show up every night. So like it has to be McDavid and Drysdale, um, beating the Dallas Stars, and I think that's yeah. really hard to do when Dallas is as good as they are. Especially when you have like Marchman and Duchesne and on like the third line and stuff like that, right. like and Pavelski's like spotting in on the second third line, like they just have a ton of depth. And uh, for me, you with that series, waves, yeah, know? exactly. And for me, with that series, like sure, the Oilers win the first game and go up one nothing, but like remember that it went to double overtime, like it was literally like a flip of a coin at that point, it could go either way. So Dallas could very well be up three, nothing in this series, right? Like a double overtime loss is nothing to be ashamed of. It, like I said, could have went either way. I expect them, like you said, to also win the series. That's who I picked. Um, I don't know if it'll be five, but I think five or six for sure. Yeah. Um, and then the other series, well, obviously... real, real quick before you, when we were, when I was watching the last game and Edmonton went up two nothing and I was like, I was listening to their fan base. Like, like not i don't want to say being cocky but they were like we got this i would like turn to my roommate and i went they're up two nothing against dallas in a playoff game that's and nothing this, yeah and this team is like their fan base is acting like they have it locked in and they ended up losing that game yeah they went down three two in the second <laughs> period like dallas just completely took over oh, the game man. and it's like uh, again this is where i think edmonton falls short is 
they're not bad defensively. Like they're, they're not, not good like defensively. Either. They're they're not a, as good defensively as Dallas. And I think as a as a unit, as an overall group, they they've improved considerably over the past few years. Um, yeah. and they're getting there. Um, but I still think that they still lack the ability to play defense as well as like any one of the other three teams. So I actually I don't believe that they can win a cup. They could absolutely prove me wrong, but they're going to do it because their offensive players are out playing. Are going to take the other team? Yeah, they're not going to do it like defense first. Well, Uh, I think the that's hilarious to me that their fan base is doing that because like we've seen Skinner choke multiple times. Right, it's also the goaltending. Yeah, and you're just like, okay, if I'm pitting Skinner against Ottinger, I'm taking Ottinger ten out of ten. So like, you know, that's why I really don't get that statement from them. Um. And the other series is the most, I mean, it's been one of the best series of the playoffs for me so far. Every game has been crazy. Two nothing um, stars. Oh, wow. So as we're talking, the stars are just making us look even better here. It's yeah. Great. But, uh, we're uh, into the other series. Uh, Rangers Panthers is tied 2-2. I have no idea which way this series is going to go. Like I picked Florida and I still am going to stick with that. But like looking at the series right now and what's happened, um, other than game one, like game two, three, four is all going to OT. It really could have been any team winning. So it's been one of the closest series of the playoffs. It's probably been some of the most exciting hockey, but it's great to watch a series that's so close. Whereas the Edmonton um, Dallas series doesn't seem to be as close as this one. Like these teams right. seem very evenly matched to me. Yeah. And it seems like it's going to be a battle of the goaltenders a little bit, you know? The like, Russian goaltenders. Too. Yeah, the Russian goalie battle. Um, I do think Florida is the better team of the two, but Shesterkin is, you know, has the ability to steal series. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. And Lafreniere, man, has been stepping it up. Um, I think he has nine, either nine or ten points in 12 playoff games. So he's finally like, I mean, this is his coming out party. Like he's finally looking like a, you know, number one uh, overall pick. I believe he had two goals um, the other day. Um not the, I think uh, in the game on the weekend, he had two goals for them. Played yep. a big part. But La- Lafreniere has been uh, huge for the Rangers uh, this playoff so far. And that's good to see, man. Like, yeah, I, I'm not a guy who likes to see players get picked first overall and bust. Like, there's a yeah. reason the guy went first overall. But, yeah, even better, actually. He has 13 points in 14 games this playoff. So he's yes. been lights out for the Rags. And, again, 28 goals, 29 assists, 57 points in 82 games on the season. So he's working his way towards... You know, we talk about it all the time, not just only because twenty two, yeah, yeah, just because a guy didn't come in and skyrocket in the league doesn't. You know, I doesn't, expect him to be point a game in a couple of years. I can definitely it, see maybe it. Maybe ne- maybe even next year, dude. If he continue, it's like kind of like what you saw from Giroux. You know, when he had his yeah, breakout, he like similar. broke out kind of during the regular season, and then, and then the playoffs. playoffs broke out even more. And we were all like, he's a number one center, and I think. It's a good chance that Lafreniere is going to be their best offensive player next year. Well, outside of Panarin, but he'll be he'll, he'll be, be up one there. of the best. Yeah. yeah, I guess Kako is their other guy where they have to figure out what to do with him. Maybe maybe that's an opportunity for them to package Kako for Natchez. Yeah, hey, that would be interesting. Definitely. That would be bad for us. Um, <laughs> good for the Rangers. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still thinking Dallas is the cup winner? That's what I'm still leaning with here. Yeah, I'm still going with Dallas. I think it'll be Dallas against Florida, and I think Dallas will probably win just because of their sheer depth. But I, I think f- the way Florida plays... um, Lots of physicality, man. Yeah, it's like they play playoff hockey. It's a so. tough, but it's tough to play against. And like, they're definitely a team, and I think you see with the Rangers, definitely a team that can wear you down over a series. Yeah, so. yeah 100%. All right, let's call it there. Uh, anything you want to add, Vasily? Uh, no, but um, I'm actually going to be doing some draft um, like research, some more draft content. So I'm going to actually have some draft articles of you know, prospect profiles of players that might be available in the Flyers range. So keep a, an eye for those as we lead up to the draft here on FlyersNateGrade.com. Yeah. And now that we're done these grades, maybe we'll talk more draft next week. Again, we're going to have Steve Cornianos on here. I think it's June 18th. Yeah. So we're going to have him on the week before facility will be at the draft. So he'll be giving us live coverage there. And then when he comes back, we're going to be doing a post draft episode with Steve again to go over the, what the flyers did attain. And we'll do the, you know, the full, all, the entire rounds or all of the rounds. Um, and then we'll, maybe we'll talk some off season stuff with him too. He's always just great for hockey knowledge. So that'll both episodes will probably be long episodes. Um, 
And this one is too, actually. Um, all right. Cool. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. Uh, just uh, again, a shout. <clears throat> excuse me. A shout out to our sponsors, Jim Steaks at Fourth and Fourth and South. Uh, make sure to go get yourself a cheesesteak. They are open again. Uh, and shout out to Public Summit Adjusters two one five seven five two zero five six zero. They will challenge your insurance company and get yourself, uh, you know, accurate quotes. Uh, and also, please, please, please subscribe if you made it this far um, and you enjoy our content. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a humongous help. Give us a like as well. Hit the notification bell for notifications. Um, follow us on iTunes and Spotify and give us a rating there. That is all the best ways to support this podcast. Um, and again, the subscribers have gone up, so we thank you all so much. You guys are amazing. Um, and thank you for the comments and everything. We try to read everything. I can't keep up with all the comments anymore, but, uh, you guys are awesome. I, I usually like at first can't keep up, but I'll take a, I've been trying hour to go back. and go yeah. back and reply to everybody. But yeah. yeah, we appreciate everybody tuning in and commenting and having discussions in our, uh, YouTube comments. It's pretty awesome to see that. It's so, so awesome to see. Um, so thank you again. We love you guys. And remember always stay. Stay.